Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate your patience. We've just got two board members that are stuck in the mess of traffic that is outside. They've advised us that they're out there, so as soon as they're able to get through that traffic and join us, we'll proceed, okay? Thank you for your patience.
Y'all ready? Thank you for your patience. This special meeting of the Board of Trustees with Coro ISD will come to order. The date is Monday, March 25th, 2024. The time is 541 and we have a quorum. To get us started, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, the first item on the agenda, Board of Trustee Business, consider approval of proclamation for theater in schools month. Martinez, please. Good evening. President Najera, members of the board, my name is Armando Martinez, Director of Fine Arts. Tonight we are here to celebrate the arts in schools. Each statewide organization representing music, dance, art, and theater has declared the month of March as the Arts in Schools Month. In celebration and recognition of all our programs and teachers' achievements, Socorro ISD has been named a NAM Best Communities for Music Education for seven years in a row and has been recognized by the Texas Art Education Association as a district of distinction for the third time. Tonight, we are here to share that for the first time, Socorro ISD has been named a premier community for theater education by the Texas Thespians Association. Over 1,026 districts were eligible to apply for this inaugural Texas Thespians Theater Education Award, and only 14 districts received this outstanding honor. Texas Thespians recognizes and honors school districts that provide their theater programs with the resources to achieve at above standard with regard to curriculum, scheduling standards, class sizes, facilities, theater safety, technical equipment, production elements, and overall support for their theater program as rooted in the Educational Theater Association's opportunity to learn standards, Texas theater knowledge and skills for fine arts, and support of Texas, oh, excuse me, Texas Thespian troop involvement. SISD is fortunate to have a strong representation of student leaders in the Texas Thespians organization, whereas part of their responsibilities and duties are to advocate for their theater programs at the campus, community, and district levels. The Thespian leaders with us today embody the traits of model leaders as set by the Texas Thespians Association. These students have led not only campus and community advocacy drives for, the, for theater education, but took it upon themselves to set up, set up meetings with district leadership and Dr. Carmen to share the importance of theater education. As a requirement of their advocacy efforts, these students are here tonight to present the proclamation to recommend that Socorro ISD recognize the month of March as Theater in Schools Month. Reading the proclamation tonight will be the president of the Montwood High School chapter of the Texas Thespians Association, Victoria Castro. March as Theater in Our Schools Month proclamation. Whereas access to theater education in our schools has proven to provide many benefits for our children, such as higher levels of empathy, emotion regulation, decision making, and a positive self image. And whereas theater education has been linked to higher levels of academic achievement, improved standardized test scores, reduction of school dropout rates, improved attendance, and a higher SAT scores. And whereas creating pathways for students going into the arts careers helps provide them with more of a motivation to stay in school and confidently moves them toward a bright future. And whereas theater education has been linked to improved listening, problem solving, and critical thinking skills. And whereas Socorro ISD schools have drama slash theater teachers who work diligently to create a classroom that allows students to learn and thrive and who are involved in district, state, and international theater arts initiatives. Now, therefore, the Socorro ISD Board of Trustees of El Paso, Texas, do hereby declare the month of March as Theater in Our Schools Month in the Socorro and Dependent School District and encourage all its members to support its theatrical programs. In witness whereof, I have here on to set my hand and cause the seal of the Socorro ISD to be asphyxiated this day, 25th day of March, 2024. Thank you, Victoria and the Montwood uh, Thespians. At this time, my administration recommends approval of the proclamation. To approve. Second. Motion to approve made by Ms. Macias, seconded by Ms. Najera. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Item passes. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, now we continue with public comment. Each person who signed up was provided a copy of the open forum basic rules and advised when they signed up that policy BED applies to the process. Please respect the process during your presentation. As a reminder, you have three minutes and let's proceed with public comment. Our first speaker, Ms. Rosie Perez, please. Good evening, President Najera and members of the board. My name is Rosie Perez and I proudly represent the members of West Texas Alliance. In recent months, there have been numerous discussions regarding the budget deficit, not only by the district, but also in the news, in news stories, both on television and in print. One of the discussions we are hearing from members is that campuses and departments are being told that they must cut their budgets by 10 to 15 percent. They are also hearing that the district is recommending cutting monitors and pre-K aides. In previous speeches, I have stated that our task force recommends cuts to items and positions far removed from students. The district is not listening because the recommendations we have heard so far are changing the health care benefits that would negatively affect employees' finances, raising class sizes that impact student learning, and increase demands on our teachers. Now, cutting monitors and pre-K aides, Special education administrators removed the crucial position of SPED clerks, and we brought this to your attention, that student services are being significantly reduced, and your diagnosticians and speech-language pathologists are struggling to meet the demands these cuts have placed on them. Now, cutting positions that directly impact kids and place undue burden on teachers and others is being considered? Enough is enough. We sat here and we listened to the presentation regarding the yearly loss predictions of students in our district. We have been here to see the teacher shortage, the bus driver shortage, and now the diagnostician and SLP shortage. You know what we have not seen a shortage of? Administrative district positions. And yet the district is recommending cuts to services to students and increasing impossible demands for teachers, diags, SLPs, and bus drivers. None of these things are going to recruit or retain employees, much less bring students to our district. You need to look at why we are losing students, ask parents where the district failed to meet their needs and offer customer, better customer service. Look at why people are not applying. Look at why employees are leaving. The culture of the district starts at the top. When you respect employees, when you respect parents, kids will want to be here and they will succeed. If you want Socorro to have a fighting chance of overcoming the challenges being faced right now, then do not punish those employees that serve students directly and do not shortchange kids' learning experiences and safety. Make better decisions. Thank you. Our next speaker, Tommy Hill. How you guys doing? Mr. Nahara, trustees of the board, thank you for having me tonight. 10 to 15 percent uh, pay cuts. Uh, this is uh, not sustainable. And plus, they're telling um, everybody that these pay cuts are going to come from the bottom up. Why would they come from the bottom up? We are the most top heavy district there is in El Paso. And we're going to cut um, monitors and school um, crossing guards, that's the main thing that they want to cut. You can get one cabinet position that'll cover the cost of 10 monitors and those crossing, actually those crossing guards, and those crossing guards don't even get benefits. They only make $60 a day. They get a flat $15 fee, they don't get raises. When you give raises, they don't get them. They don't get nothing but they're four hours a day. And that's what we want to cut. They, they have uh, kids crossing the street, second, third grade. We want those kids across the street with no monitor. That's what's being told to them. They are being told to cut from the bottom. You need to cut from the top uh, at campus. Now, will it affect bus drivers by routings um, collapsing? Maybe you guys try to get us to do elementary, middle school, and high school. That's impossible. That's the only thing that we're not doing. I go to work 
and I nearly live on a bus as it is today. We just drive because there's so much need in the district. You're going to try to cut that? How are the kids going to get to school? <coughs> we are going at this all wrong. If you want to cut something, cut out the waste. Don't cut out from the bottom. A very important person told me something. That this is for the kids. Very smart lady told me this. And it still needs to be for the kids. You're making cuts that is going to sacrifice the kids' safety. That's what's being told to all your programs. Why? Why? You got to look in the mirror and see why this is being told to all your programs. Cut from the top, not the bottom. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Sammy Carejo. There's a lot of security today. Wow, awesome. All right, guys, as we all know, Dr. Carmen's not here again. None of us are surprised. Now, with everything that's going on with the cuts, with the salaries, with the student ratios getting bigger and bigger, everybody's saying, well, that's not our fault. That's Dr. Carmen's fault. He's no longer here, right? Absolutely not. I don't want you guys to do that. He did what he did, and he's gone. He took his stuff about 2.30 this afternoon, for those who don't know. He's gone. The problem is still here. Why? Because you guys. You guys make decisions. The superintendent is supposed to implement them. Is that correct? Yes, the answer is yes. We're going to continue holding you accountable. These teachers in the back who should be retiring, instead, what are they doing? They get more students added to their classrooms, especially the little ones. Anyone when we have little ones? It's like daycare. And you're going to make it worse for them? Please do not push all the blame on Dr. Carmen. He got what he deserves. He's out of here. We've seen everything. We've seen the TEA uh, results. But guess what? We've also seen other stuff. Isn't that right, Mr. Guerra? The answer is yes. If we don't hold people accountable, no one's going to learn their lesson, and they're going to continue to do what they're doing. And for those who don't know, Mr. Paul Guerra was found by TEA to violate certain rules by not excusing himself from information having to do with contracts. For two years, I've been saying it. There's a gentleman who just walked in, Mr. Ruben Avalos. Hi, good to see you again. Mocked me, called me names, called me fat. Hey, Captain Obvious, we all know I'm fat. But guess what? You are not allowed to kick anybody out for public scrutiny there, Mr. Guerra. So since you are here, we are going to tell, talk about the TEA findings. Your company, INSCO, you participated in the negotiating. You participated in voting for your company that you were employed for to be on the list. But yet you're bothered that I'm saying this? The district tried to say it wasn't their fault that you did not provide the disclosures necessary. You've been here since 2010. You don't know the process? Or is it that you've been here since 2010 and you know the process? Why do you know the process? Your brother-in-law, Frank Apodaca. Frank Apodaca was convicted and sent to prison in 2012 for one of the things bribing different school boards to include which one? This one, SISD. Mr. Frank Apodaca also lives within 600 feet from Mr. Paul Guerra. If we don't learn from the past, we're going to repeat it. I highly recommend that every single person here on YouTube, here today, not just hold Dr. Carmen accountable, but hold Paul Guerra and anybody else who has done the wrong thing. Thank you. Continuing with our agenda, district report, uh, 5A presentation and discussion regarding forensic audit report from Weber and Tidwell to include possible action on findings and recommendations. Is Mr. Kentner available? There he is. Yeah, good evening. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Can you hear us okay? Uh, can you turn up the volume? I can. The volume is muffled. 
I can't hear it. Oh, it looks like I'm seeing myself. Let me see if I can fix this real quick and I'll get started. Okay, are you able to see the uh, slide on my screen? Yes, sir. How's the volume? Okay. Okay, I can hear it. All right, well, I'm going to get started. Uh, first, let me say uh, uh, good evening, uh, Board President Nahara, members of the board, um, and, and thanks for allowing me to present virtually this evening. Uh, I had a, a conflict that I was unable to, uh, to move, so I, I do appreciate it. Um, so this evening, I'm going to walk through the uh, findings and recommendations that are included in the uh, draft reports <laughs> number two and three uh, that uh, that have been provided to the board. Uh, and just as a, a reminder, we submitted the uh, report number one back in December related to the bond funds and uh, construction scope of work. And so these uh, reports and, and what we're going to talk about this evening is, is covering all of the other scopes of work um, that were included in the forensic audit. And to, to provide a, a refresher, um, and I know some of the, at least two of the board members that are here currently were not on the board when we conducted phase one. So just to provide a, uh, a reminder, um, our scope of work was, was, uh, determined during phase one uh, during a process where we uh, conducted a, a survey and interview uh, questionnaire process with uh, the those board members uh, who wish to participate which included uh, five of the seven board members at the, at the time and we prepared a, uh, a ranking of potential scopes of work which is what what you see on this slide uh, based on the level of priority uh, that was uh, aggregated across the different board members um, and we uh, ended up picking the ones that were selected as or ranked as high or moderate on an aggregate basis across all of the board members, uh, which ended up being the uh, the top uh, nine scopes of work that you see here. Um, and again, number two, the bond funds and construction expenditures uh, is is what was included in report number one. So the other uh, eight scopes of work um, are what we're going to talk about this evening. Uh, real quick, let me just uh, touch on the, the work performed, um, and this is a, at a high level uh, as far as the overall scopes of work. Um, we conducted interviews with uh, 25 individuals or more, many of those included you know, multiple conversations, discussions, um, and that included board members, uh, cabinet members, administrators, uh, different department directors, uh, current and former employees. Um, and, and as well as multiple site visits. And, um, and let me also just say, you know, thank you to, uh, to all of those individuals that uh, were involved in the interview process and the document request process and their cooperation, uh, which included uh, individuals from the you know, finance department, human resources, uh, the technology purchasing, um, and, and federal programs, um, there's probably some others, but, but that really enabled us to conduct the forensic audit um, efficiently. Uh, we also obtained uh, access to different electronic databases with financial uh, information, including the uh, ERP software uh, through Tyler Muniz, um, where we could extract financial data and reports, as well as um, the backup documentation uh, we also had uh, remote access or read-only access to the uh, shared drive that was uh, utilized by the purchasing department, as well as uh, folders for, for other departments as well, so that we could uh, go in and, and pull backup documentation as needed. We analyzed the payroll register data uh, for the review period, which was uh, a substantial analysis with a lot of data, as you can imagine, for the school district the size of Socorro ISD. Uh, and, and looking at that from a, a five-year period. 
We also reviewed all of the board meeting records during the review period, which included the, the, min, the minutes and agendas, board packets, and the, the meeting videos, and then additional work steps that are more specific to each scope of work uh, that we'll talk about in more detail. And, uh, and I'm going to get into the, the summary of findings uh, next, but uh, just as a kind of introduction, um, you know, for I know that for many of you, this is the, the first time uh, going through the forensic audit and, you know, the, the findings that we're going to talk about, you know, we started with a very broad scope, um, looking at data and kind of honing in on, you know, areas for further review and, and kind of, uh, you know, deciding and determining where we needed to, you know, dig deeper. Uh, and so what we're going to talk about this evening, as far as the findings, you know, these are, you know, areas where we, uh, you know, did further review and, and it may come off as, you know, all negative. And that's, you know, really a function of, you know, we're talking about the, the findings. So we're not going to, you know, talk about everything. Um, you know, there are some areas that we can highlight where, you know, we, we noticed improvements, um, but I just want to make it, you know, that typically the, that presentation for these, it, it um, you know, we're, we are focused on those things where we identified concerns or areas for further review, um, but also, you know, areas for improvement. So I just wanted to preface that with um, this discussion with, with that point before we jump in. The, the first uh, scope of work that we're going to talk about was the employee compensation and stipends. Uh, and so I wanted to include this slide just to give a high level overview of the magnitude of the, the total compensation for the review, the review period, which uh, approximately $1.5 billion. Uh, this slide uh, provides a breakout of that amount, um, including the, the major categories that we identified, which were uh, the base salaries and wages, uh, which was 1.4 million of the 1.5, uh, 93%. Uh, then it's the the stipends and extra duty pay, which was 62 million, and we'll talk about um, those in more detail here in a second. And then the the bonuses um, and retention payments, which were about 37.9 million. Um, and 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 one observation that. Um, you can see from this chart in, in fiscal year 2020, there was a, a little over 9% increase in uh, total employee compensation. And that was driven um, the primarily by the, the bonuses that were paid out. Uh, it's a little over 6 million. This was the first of the, uh, the annual retention bonuses that were approved with the budget, which um, again, we'll talk about this in more detail, but this was where the, there was the $1,000 per employee um, you know, for full-time employees as part of the uh, employee retention uh, authorized by the board. So we'll talk about, you know, how those were approved each year, um, but I wanted to kind of highlight on that high-level observation um, as far as the 9% increase in, in fiscal year 2020. Uh, we summarized the annual pay increases or raises uh, that were authorized by the board each year during the review period, which uh, those ranged from 2% to 6% each year. Uh, this is uh, a summary of those by uh, the employee category. So uh, you, you can see that those, you know, were, uh, I think in fiscal year 23 was the first year where there was some variance in as far as different uh, employee categories having different percentage increases. Um, but, uh, you know, again, th th this was the, those pay increases that were authorized during the, re the review period. We compared the, uh, the, the authorized pay increases to the actual compensation that was included in the payroll register uh, that I mentioned earlier. So this is the, the data of all of the actual compensation uh, paid across all employees for the entire review period. And so what we were uh, examining as part of this analysis was, you know, are there any instances where employees were paid above what was authorized by the board? And uh, so what we identified in that analysis, we, you know, we started by identifying, uh, you know, situations where an employee's pay increase was, you know, maybe 10% or more or above what was authorized. Um, and, 
and then looked at the supporting documentation uh, in the DocuNav um, electronic database uh, to see if there was any any explanation. And so what we we were able to determine it was that in all of those instances where the the annual increase uh, was higher than the authorization, uh, those pertained to situations where the employee uh, was either promoted or moved to a different position, or uh, in in some cases there was uh, a position had a pay grade adjustment. You know, in addition to the annual pay increases that that may have. Uh, you know, accounted for the, the reason for those pay increases. So we, we didn't identify any situations where, you know, a uh, employee's actual compensation was higher than what was authorized um, based on what was approved by the board and the compensation plan each year. Uh, I, I just talked about the, the pay grade adjustments. So we also compared the compensation plan uh, each year during the re review period. Um, and, and in this analysis, we were specifically looking for uh, positions where the, they were adjusted up, you know, one pay grade or more and, and wanted to, to quantify those. So what you see in this, in this table, uh, you know, if we look at fiscal year 2021, for example, uh, there were 68 positions um, out of, in the compensation plan that were increased um, or either increased by one or two pay grades or um, were moved to the placement scales. And um, what we determined was that these were based on a, a pay study that was uh, conducted by TASB. Uh, the, the, the board essentially was the district commissioned a pay study through TASB. Um, received those recommendations, and uh, and then those were incorporated. Uh, those were recommended uh, as part of the compensation plan. So that that was um, the basis for the you know in fiscal year 2021, uh, and then in in fiscal year 2023 where we observed 23 pay grade adjustments as well. Um, but I just wanted to to mention that you know as far as the you know, changes year over year. We have the, the pay increases authorized by the board, but we also have, you know, some movement and adjustments with respect to pay grades. So we identified 96 uh, instances of, of those occurrences. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the stipends uh, in the stipend component of the employee compensation, which totaled approximately $62 million during the review period. Uh, this chart is uh, a summary of the stipends by category. So this is based on the actual stipends paid uh, through the payroll register. Um, so we've gone through and, and categorized all of those. Um, and, and you can see the, the largest category being the, the summer school uh, and extra duty pay, which was uh, close to $20 million during the review period. And then you can see each of the the uh, other categories. Um, one of the the observations that I wanted to to touch on with this slide was uh, you can see that in fiscal year 2022 the uh, stipends increased by almost 13 uh, percent from 12.2 million to 13.8 million. Um, when we drill down into the data, the uh, the the basis for that, and you can see it in the top line, is primarily the summer school uh, and extra duty pay. Uh, so then we, we drilled down further, um, which increased from about 2.9 million to 5.2 million. So we, we drilled down to kind of understand, you know, what's the, the reason or the basis for that increase. Um, and what we determined was that that was related to, uh, as part of the use of the ESSER funds and the accelerated learning initiatives, which had been authorized um, by the board that there was additional extra duty pay being paid to teachers for uh, tutoring and after school hours that um, is accounts for the the bulk of the increase in uh, FY 2022. Uh, we identified 311 unique stipends that were included in the compensation plan. Um, I put slash DEAA regulation, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. 
Uh, but the, those 311 different stipends, uh, those ranged anywhere from $100 per year to $15,000 per year. Um, we also conducted an analysis of uh, the number of stipends that were received by uh, each employee, or I guess to put it, um, you know, how many stipends did each employee receive, I guess would be a better way to, to phrase that. So this table here uh, shows the analysis. Um, so you can see that somewhere on average of 1,500 or so employees each year during the re review period um, received one stipend. Uh, and then on average, uh, around 1,100 employees received multiple stipends per year. And that you know ranged from anywhere from two stipends per year to uh, a couple of uh, employees received uh, as many as nine stipends in the, the earlier years in our review period. I mentioned the DEAA regulation. Um, one of the, uh, the findings uh, that we identified was that prior to 2022, the, uh, the stipends were approved administratively uh, through DEAA regulation. Uh, and so what we observed was that when the compensation plan was uh, presented to the board each year as part of the, the budget process, uh, the DEA regulation would be um, attached to the back of that, which included the listing of the stipends. Um, and so I guess the distinguishing uh, factor here was that these would have been approved um, by administration uh, as implied in DEA regulation. And then the board was made aware as part of their the presentation of the compensation plan, but mechanically, you know, the board was not approving the stipends prior to 2022. Uh, we did observe uh, starting in June 2022 uh, when the annual compensation plan for fiscal year 2023 was presented to the board that this was um, uh, corrected and that the stipends were included as part of the compensation plan that was uh, presented to the board for review and approval. And so starting in uh, 2022, the, the stipends were uh, re approved by the board as part of the review, the review and approval of the compensation plan. We also conducted an analysis of the stipend payments in comparing that to the compensation plan with respect to you know the stipends that are uh, authorized by the board. So we identified uh, some inconsistencies um, with the stipends as identified in the payroll register, i.e. The, the stipends actually paid and then the stipends that are included in the compensation plan. Um, and through further discussions with uh, individuals from the Human Resources Department, we determined that uh, part of that um, inconsistency relates to the uh, the use of the stipend names and, and descriptions, which uh, evolved uh, in the compensation plan over time, um, but haven't always been updated uh, within the payroll register. And so we have uh, identified situations where, you know, what is uh, being paid and referenced in the payroll register, you know, is not specifically listed in the compensation plan. Um, and it's, it's, uh, to what we, our understanding is that it's, it's a matter of the naming convention and the, the name, you know, being changed. And, and we've included those examples that we identified. So if you look at the the first row of this table, the soccer C is the stipend name that's identified in the payroll register, um, which is not a stipend name that's included in the compensation plan. Um, but we were informed that this uh, aligns to the stipend uh, in the compensation plan for the development coach um, and the, the amounts um, align as well. It's just there's a difference in the naming convention that creates um, this inconsistency. Uh, and, and there's a few other examples that were listed below um, with the name changing over time and creating this um, this discrepancy. Uh, health sciences was uh, was one that was being referred to as uh, the CTE advanced academies, which included uh, a few different 
um, academies that were clustered together, but there wasn't a specific breakout in the compensation plan for the health sciences. But um, so there's those are the four examples. And then there were uh, I, I don't have it on this slide, but th there were a couple of um, stipends that were added in the middle of the year. One example was the the physician stipend uh, for twelve thousand. That was uh, it, it was because it was added in the middle of the year, um, which was uh, the position was approved uh, by the board, um, but the stipend was paid prior to the. Uh, compensation plan being approved by the board with the new stipend. So it's it's similar to the issue we discussed previously where uh, because the stipends are approved or prior to 2022 were approved through DEA regulation, there's situations where the stipends were being paid uh, prior to when they were, um, you know, technically authorized by the board. Um, so if, if, if that makes sense, and, and I'm happy to add additional explanation to that if needed. The last section of the employee compensation uh, is the employee bonuses, um, and those totaled 37.9 million during the review period. So this uh, table here breaks out the, the different types of bonuses um, that were approved, and those started in, in fiscal year 2020 uh, with the first of the the lump sum bonuses, um, which were $1,000 per full-time employee, so those totaled around $6 million, uh, and those continued uh, in the subsequent fiscal years, and uh, additional bonuses were also added um, as authorized by the board uh, through uh, COVID relief and ESSER funds um, payments with uh, an additional uh, six million in FY 2021, so essentially another 1,000 per FTE, and then uh, in FY 2022 that was uh, 2,000. So um, you know, I guess a, another way to look at it would be in FY 2020 there was the 1,000 <clears> the <throat> FY 2021 it was 2,000 combined in, in those bonus retention payments, and then FY. 22, it was 3,000. So there was kind of an incremental increase in the in the bonuses um, in in those three years. We also analyzed the staffing of full-time employees um, based on information that's submitted to the TEA annually. So this chart shows the staffing uh, by category. Um, and, and these are based on the, the categories that are included in the data provided to TEA. Uh, the one observation that I wanted to point out here relates to the, the auxiliary staff, um, which there was uh, pretty significant decreases in the number of FTEs in FY 2019, uh, and then again in FY 2020, um, and then uh, there was an increase in the, in the following years and spe specifically in FY 2023, but it still gets back to about where it was in uh, fiscal year 2018. But the uh, overall percentage change in FY 2021 and 23 is really driven by the auxiliary uh, staffing positions and um, adding back uh, full-time employees that, uh, that were a part of the decrease in fiscal year 2019-20. We also conducted a benchmarking analysis where we compared the district's uh, staffing levels to 22 other similar school districts um, on a normalized basis, so essentially you know, normalized for enrollment, so on a uh, employee, full-time employee per student basis to make sure that we're comparing on a apples to apples basis. Uh, so what we observed as part of this analysis, uh, that the number of FTEs per student for the district uh, in FY 2022 was lower than all of the other 22 uh, school districts in the peer group uh, and second lowest uh, in FY 2023. So essentially the, the overall uh, number of FTEs relative to uh, the number of students was was low, uh, the lowest and second lowest um, when we compared to 22 other school districts, which are we 
those are based on you know, size and, and location and, and geography and so forth. Um, when we drilled down into the specific uh, categories of, uh, of employees, of full-time employees, um, what we observed was the auxiliary position category was the primary driver uh, for the uh, the overall staffing uh, shortfall when compared to the peer group, um, and that included primarily uh, positions classified as maintenance, transportation, custodial, and uh, child nutrition. Um, conversely, we also can conducted a benchmarking analysis uh, based on the financial PEMS data submitted to the TEA, uh, where we compared the district's total compensation uh, for substitutes as a percentage of total compensation to all employees uh, and compared that to the other 22 school districts. Uh, and what we determined was that the district's uh, compensation uh, for substitutes on a normalized basis was higher than any of the other 22 school districts for fiscal year 2022. And so um, there's, you know, likely a relationship there where we see the, the lower number of FTEs uh, compared to other school districts, um, which uh, I think has, has driven the need for increased need for substitutes to um, you know, fill that fill that gap, and so I think that's what the data is is showing based on this benchmarking analysis, comparing to these other 22 school districts. The the next scope of work that I'm going to talk about is the campus funds, um, and I guess before uh, do do we want to stop and 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 take questions after each scope of work or, or you know does it make sense for me to keep going through and take questions at the end? Open the questions, I think, after it's each. Good. Hmm? I can wait till the end. Okay, we'll wait to the <clears> end, <throat> Mr. Kasner. Okay, let me, uh, let me share my screen here. Sorry. Okay. So campus funds, um, just a, a quick overview and, and, and some of the observations that we determined as we uh, started this review. So we, uh, each of the 49 campuses uh, within the district maintains a separate bank account where they hold their campus funds. Um, and these are the deposits uh, from fundraising events and other activities. Uh, and then the disbursements of those funds throughout the school year. The, uh, the district utilizes school books, uh, which is an accounting software that's used for the record keeping of those financial activities across campuses. Uh, and each campus has uh, their administrators and clerical staff that's responsible for the record keeping uh, for each campus. Uh, the, the finance department does reconciliation of the financial reports um, that are generated through school books and, and for each campus and compares or sh should say reconciles those to the bank statements uh, periodically. So ensuring that the information that is being uh, entered in by each campus matches up to what the bank statements reflect as the, you know, the, the balance um, in, the, in their account. When we analyzed all of the deposits and disbursements across all 49 campuses, um, we identified total deposits of 26.5 million, uh, which was uh, consisted of 337,000 transactions. Uh, so, that, you know, these are a lot of transactions that are, you know, deposits that are, I think the math works out, that's less than $100 on a per transaction basis, but just to give a sense of, you know, there's a, a large volume of small deposits that are making up the 26 and a half million coming in, uh, and, and that's across 63,000 different sources. Um, so by sources, we mean if there's a, um, a fundraising event or a donation, you know, those are all deposited and uh, associated with the individual uh, that either 
is responsible for the donation or that made the deposit. And so there's a large volume of uh, of sources of funds in the in the data that we reviewed. Um, with respect to disbursements, uh, those total 26.1 million, um, and that's 92,000 transactions uh, to over 10,000 payees. Uh, this table on this slide shows the uh, annual comparison of the deposits to the disbursements. Um, and one of the things that you, you, you might see for fiscal year 2021, there was a substantial decrease, um, which you know, is related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, where the, the fundraising events and the activities were were not happening during that year, um, and so that's uh, you know accounts for the 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 I guess shortfall in the disbursements where there was um, less fundraising activities, but for the most part there was uh, overall deposits um, uh, that came in above the the outflows or the disbursements each year. We also analyzed uh, the, the deposits and disbursements for each campus, um, and we've got the detail that's included as an appendix uh, to the re draft report, uh, but for purposes of you know, showing this on a slide, so we've included uh, the, the, campus, um, the campuses with the highest and lowest range of the balances, um, which the average campus fund balance was 51,000, um, and not surprisingly, the, the larger campuses, um, primarily the high schools, had the larger campus balances, which uh, those are reflected on the top part of this chart that with the six schools that had a campus fund balance over 100,000. And then the smaller schools, uh, primarily the elementary schools, um, had lesser balances um, that we're showing here. But we, we were able to to reconcile the balances to the bank statements um, and confirm that with the exception of a few small discrepancies that I, I think relate to, to timing uh, differences that we were able to reconcile that the, the balances that are in the accounting software are consistent with the balances reflected in the, in the bank statements. Uh, the, the next scope of work uh, that we're going to talk about is the travel expenses and employee reimbursements. Based on our review of information uh, from the uh, Tyler Muniz uh, data, where we looked at all of the uh, financial transactions that were allocated to the object code, uh, which is 6411 is the object code utilized for the employee travel expenses. We identified uh, approximately six and a half million uh, in employee travel expenses during the review period, which uh, included 13,000 transactions. We broke those out and categorized all of those um, into these four categories that you see in this table. And I can explain you know, at a high level what each of these categories represent, but the, the largest category is the, the direct build, um, which was 5.2 million out of the six and a half million. And, and what direct build is referring to is these are expenses that are paid for uh, directly by the district um, as opposed to you know, a reimbursement where the em employee pays out of pocket. The majority of these direct build expenses are being paid uh, to travel agencies, which um, there's uh, several different travel agencies that the district um, has you know, partnered with for purposes of um, uh, obtaining you know, discounts and efficiencies with respect to, to booking travel. So that's what is the, uh, the primary uh, type of expenses included in, in the direct build. Uh, the expense reimbursements, which was about a million dollars during the re review period, these are expenses when employees um, incur expenses out of pocket related to travel and then submit a a request for reimbursement, which is then paid by the district. So that's what we're talking about. And, and typically, uh, those pertain to uh, to meals or to to mileage, um, whereas direct build category was uh, primarily related to the hotels or the airfare, uh, things that could be you know um, booked for a group of employees. 
The credit card travel expenses uh, were around three hundred twenty-three thousand, um, and and what we noted here was that you know those were pretty minimal, um, and but have started increasing in the last two fiscal years. And um, what we, you know, through our interviews of of individuals in the finance department, you know, the uh, our understanding is you know there there's um, you know more situations where the the merchants and the vendors, you know, the hotel chains require credit card to uh, hold a deposit or to hold a room. Uh, so there's more and more situations where it's becoming necessary to you know, use a credit card. Uh, there, there are credit card um, procedures and the, the credit card purchases, you know, are uh, required to adhere to the same travel policies as the other types of expenses, um, which is, you know, getting a purchase order, um, you know, which needs to be done, you know, more than at least two weeks in advance of travel, submitting uh, the, sub the supporting documentation um, and, and, and so forth. For our review of the travel expenses, we selected a sample of 72 travel expenses, um, which was a, a what we call a, a, a risk-based sample, um, or a, actually I should say it was a hybrid of a risk-based and random sample, um, meaning that we selected transactions with, with higher dollar amounts um, and then also selected some randomly just to make sure that we you know, looked at a wide variety of different types of travel expenses. Uh, for each of those that we sampled, we also looked at the supporting documentation, um, which included the, the travel request form, the purchase order, uh, the receipts, a travel justification form, and you know, did an evaluation to assess compliance with the uh, the district's travel policy. Which um, in the draft report, we we have a, a table that uh, goes into detail with all of those requirements. It's a little bit you know, too expansive to include in this summary. We noted that the uh, compliance with the district's travel policy uh, improved during the review period, um, while at the same time the policies uh, also became more stringent. And so I think what we, uh, from talking to individuals in the finance department, you know, that was attributed to um, adding uh, individuals who work in finance department that are focused, you know, 100% on the review and approval of uh, the travel expenses and reviewing the supporting documentation. Uh, so I think that that's been the, a, a big part of, of the improvement uh, that we saw with respect to, you know, missing documentation or, uh, you know, those, those things where there were a few instances early on where we, you know, were unable to locate a, a purchase order or a justification form uh, that was less the case uh, in the last two or three years of the review period. We also noted that some of the expenditures that were included in the uh, travel expense object code, um, you know, were, were not necessarily related to employee travel. Uh, we noted some that were you know, turned out to be more related to on-site training. So we we had an example here: the uh, online training by. Uh, uh, Savis in March 2022, which was around $25,000, was was coded to the employee travel, um, but was was really on-site training, and there were a few other instances of those um, that that we identified. Uh, we also noted that the travel policy, which was um, you know one of the ways that it was made more stringent during the review period, was to reduce the the uh, time. Um, for, I'm sorry, the, the, the two weeks was is currently what the travel policy requires um, with respect to you know, getting a purchase order in advance. Um, and uh, there's throughout the, the review period, you know, there continued to be instances where, you know, that the purchase order date was, you know, less than two weeks and, and there's, you know, different, um, you know, explanations and, and for this, and, and sometimes it is, you know, unavoidable, um, but that was the, probably the most common area where when we compared to the travel policy, you know, there was, um, you know, some areas where, you know, that one wasn't being met consistently. 
we also identified an instance where uh, an individual, um, his travel expenses were paid by the district um, and he was not an employee of the district at the time. Uh, and so just to provide a little bit more context, uh, this was in uh, March, April, 2022. Uh, there was a individual who um, the district had had offered a uh, employment contract to, and and that individual accepted. Was anticipated to to begin working for the district. Uh, the district paid for his uh, registration as well as his airfare, which is around fifteen hundred dollars, uh, to travel to this conference in in San Diego with uh, the superintendent and and several other board members. Um, Subsequently, after the conference, the uh, individual um, had to uh, retract their offer or their acceptance of the offer, so they never actually became an employee of the district. Uh, we did confirm that in around July of 2022, the uh, the district did invoice the uh, that individual uh, for the uh, for the approximate $1,500, and then and did receive a, a check payment. Uh, to repay the district for for that amount, but there was, um, you know, the the expenses that that were approved at the time did relate to an individual that was not an employee of the of the district. The next scope of work that we're going to talk about is the uh, the federal funds and grants. Uh, this uh, chart shows the breakout of the approximate $445 million um, in, in federal funds that were uh, expended by the district during the review period. So these are broken out across 24 different uh, federal funds. Um, so each federal fund has a unique uh, fund number that the district uses to track uh, the expenditures associated with each, uh, with each fund. Um, we did select a sample uh, and review uh, certain uh, areas of these, uh, primarily with respect to the the ESSER funds, um, based on um, you know information that we you know learned during phase one, um, and those being higher risk, given that they're uh, they're new and they're still evolving guidance on on the use of those funds. Um, but you know at a high level. You know, the National School of Breakfast and Lunch is the by far the the largest area uh, with 169 million uh, out of the 445 million. Uh, then the Title One, which um, ranged anywhere from 10 to 14 million uh, for a total of 70 million, uh, and then the ESSER Three, which as of uh, the end of fiscal year 2023, uh, the district had expended 60.8 million uh, out of the. Uh, 99 million that were uh, allocated through the ESSER program. Uh, so there's additional expenditures in FY 2024, uh, or at least that's our understanding that are uh, still, um, or I guess at this point that would have been expended that aren't accounted for here. Um, but this this provides a breakout of, of all of the different federal funds based on the, the federal program. As I mentioned, we, we did perform a further review of the ESSER funds uh, that were received by the district um, related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So there were uh, three different, um, uh, I guess, series of ESSER funds, which we refer to as ESSERs, ESSER 1, 2, and 3. Uh, so we, we took a sample of 28 uh, ESSER 1, 2, and 3 transactions and reviewed the supporting documentation um, and what we uh, determined was that we were able to uh, identify the justification form and the, which was uh, submitted through the TEA's justification form. And, and essentially it's a pre-approval uh, by TEA. So we were able to identify for each of those 28 transactions that we sampled that there was a, a justification form um, with, with authorization. Uh, we did note that we there were variances uh, as far as when we compared the spending plan that was presented uh, as part of a public hearing for ESSER 3, which was uh, July 2021. Uh, when we compared that to the actual ESSER expenditures, there, there were some variances, um, and there's 
a couple of different reasons for that. Again, we're not saying that these are uh, unallowable, but we're just saying that there was, uh, you know, changes in what was presented as part as far as that public hearing, and then how the funds were actually expended. Um, and and the reason that we we bring that up is because we, you know, based on the information we reviewed, there, there was a, um, a a fairly expansive uh, process to identify how the district was gonna use the ESSER three funds, which uh, as I mentioned, represented almost $100 million worth of, of federal funds. Uh, there was surveys that were conducted with around 3,700 different stakeholders, including you know, teachers and parents and, and community members. Um, so there was a lot of you know, effort in what went into the public hearing in July, 2021. Um, that being said, you know, we're the, the guidance uh, evolved, the district's need needs evolved, um, you know, subsequent to July 2021. Um, but there were, you know, some some changes. One of which was the, uh, you know, the use of 8.3 million uh, for for employee retention payments, um, which uh, you know was part of a board authorization with the uh, the annual budget and compensation plan. Um, we also noted that the the uh, spending plan for SU3 included $10 million uh, for HVAC upgrades, uh, but it, it did not include anything specifically related to the lighting upgrades. And then we, we observed that there were um, expenditures related to uh, the LED lighting upgrades and retrofits at, at different campuses that were ultimately um, expended with SU3 funds, which um, those were pre-approved by uh, by TEA um, and linked to uh, you know one of the requirements for uh, the metrics needed for S 3 So there, there was you know a justification form that was submitted and approved for uh, pre-approval. Also wanted to to talk about uh, the idea B formula grants with respect to the the federal funds, um, and, and these are the federal grants that are uh, related to the special education uh, services. Um, so these funds are you know really designed to support special education uh, and the related services. Uh, these were um, you know towards the top of the of the federal programs with the highest expenditures, uh, totaled forty one point four million during the review period. Um, so we noted uh, through a number of different interviews that we conducted with um, both current and former uh, employees and, and specifically, you know, former employees um, in the special education department uh, that there was uh, consistent concerns that were raised related to uh, the understaffing of uh, certified special education teachers. Um, and when, uh, these during these interviews, you know, they, the the uh, individuals elaborated that you know specifically they had concerns that students um, their individualized education programs or IEPs were not being adhered to as a result of the understaffing, and that there were uh, you know, situations where students with disabilities were being serviced by substitute teachers. Uh, so we have not, uh, other than gathering the information that's collected. In the uh, in the interviews and in you know analyzing the use of the idea B formula funds, um, so we have not done additional review of uh, you know assessing whether the you know information from the interviews regarding IEP plans or um, you know substitutes um, the use of substitutes in that department whether you know that was the case or not the case, and, and that's I think a very uh, specialized area. So we've, you know, one of our recommendations is that, um, you know, it, to further investigate those specific issues that the, the district, you know, put out a request for qualifications for uh, firms, which there are firms out there that are specialized in, in you know, reviewing special education departments and, and operations and, um, so just, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear that our observations here are, you know, really limited to the information that we received during the interviews, but it was something that was uh, consistent across, 
you know, number of, of interviews. Next, we're going to talk about the uh, review that we did with respect to the hiring practices. And uh, primarily our review um, base was, was focused on the, the campus interview processes. Um, and what we determined, and this was um, through, you know, both our review of the electronic documents uh, that are maintained on the DocuNav system, but also through, you know, interviews and discussions with the Human Resources Department. Prior to 2022, the candidate interview process was uh, not standardized um, across campuses. Um, so we uh, observed that some, cam some campuses were using uh, forced ranking sheets, for example, while others um, had their own forms or you know, didn't have a specific form, um, but it was, it, it was not standardized with respect to the uh, interview documentation and the, and the ranking sheets. Um, we also observed that prior to 2022, it was common practice uh, at some campus, some campuses at least, that uh, not to maintain those ranking sheets uh, after a candidate was recommended. Uh, and we we'll, we'll talk about this one in our scope of work related to the to the records retention um, here in a little bit. We also noted that uh, in 2022, the uh, the HR department implemented, um, and this is the name of the form, the interview protocols agreement uh, as an effort to standardize the interview processes across campuses. Um, and I think it was based on um, you know some of the items that we just discussed. Uh, so as part of the the new standardized form that was implemented in 2022. Uh, individuals who are serving on interview committees are required to uh, acknowledge their compliance with the hiring protocols, um, uh, which includes a list of, of different items, uh, one of which is that the, uh, any rankings or notes that are taken by the interview committee member uh, during the interview are required to be submitted uh, to human resources uh, with the recommendation and then uh, such that they can be you know, maintained um, based on the two-year records retention requirement. We also uh, observed and, and uh, became aware of information uh, through interviews with um, current and former employees um, where a common theme uh, through those interviews uh, was the perception of favoritism um, as it related to influencing hiring decisions at campuses. Uh, and specifically, what we're talking about is a perception of less qualified candidates being hired or promoted based on personal relationships with campus leadership. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I do want to mention, um, you know, with the information, so in, in other um, forensic audits, you know, we have done an analysis to compare, um, you know, ranking sheets and, and we can determine if there's any change where if a recommended candidate, um, you know, is not recommended to the board or approved by uh, administration, you know, with the information uh, that, you know, was available, there really wasn't, you know, any way to determine if there were candidates that were being recommended that were not being approved. So, uh, you know, I think this is is somewhat of an anecdotal, um, you know, observation, but it, it is based on a number of different uh, comments from uh, current and former employees. Um, in addition to that, uh, there was also a common theme uh, related to a fear of retaliation, uh, specifically if in an individual, um, you know, were to raise concerns about campus practices or leadership or um, you know, make a report um, to administration, you know, related to something that they feel was being done, you know, incorrectly or improperly. Uh, there was a fear that, that there would be retaliation and uh, specifically related to, you know, being promoted or the ability to, you know, move up within that campus. Um, from our conversations with, with these individuals, these were uh, perceptions that go back you know, five to 10 years um, or more. So the, these are not 
uh, new, but these are something that, you know, uh, were consistently mentioned um, as part of our interview process. Uh, and th these were also, this was one of the, the reasons that a number of the individuals who are former uh, district employees uh, decided to leave is because, you know, their, their feeling of, you know, there was no opportunity to move up because of the perception of the favoritism and the fear of retaliation. Records retention practices. Uh, this was another scope of work um, that we included in our review. So we reviewed all of the document destruction logs um, that are maintained by the district uh, through the, uh, the records department, um, which is you know falls under the, the human resources uh, department. Uh, so th these were uh, spreadsheets. Excel spreadsheets were the format that these were maintained in, and, and that's subsequently changed, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But uh, based on those Excel um, logs of documents that were uh, destroyed, you know, based on the, the records retention schedule, we identified over 10,000 boxes of documents um, that were destroyed during the review period. And this, this table shows the uh, destruction date um, and then the number of boxes uh, as well as the range of documents um, that's based on the you know, description. Each box has a description that's included in the log of, of you know, the contents. Um, so a couple of observations here. So the, the documents are typically being destroyed once, um, in some cases twice per year. Uh, in 2017, 18, and 19, and, and even in 2020, you, know, you can see if you look at the document date range, there was uh, you know, documents that go back as far as 1960 that were still being maintained at the warehouse um, that were destroyed uh, in those years. Those numbers have decreased, um, and uh, we'll look at the, those numbers in more detail. Um, but uh, just to provide an overview, you know, as far as the documents, of the boxes of documents that were destroyed, this, you know, it's around 10,000 boxes uh, during. 2017 through 2023. In March 2023, the district uh, started outsourcing their records management program to a third party, which was Records Retention Consultants, um, or RCI. And so through their contract with RCI, they uh, RCI processed and cataloged all of the district's inactive records. Uh, established the cloud-based records management database. So essentially, uh, you know, converted from Excel into a, um, you know, more digital format with automated reminders and, and um, a, a web-based uh, database that could be used to track the records going forward. Uh, and then incorporated the record retention dates from the TSLAC requirements uh, so that each box has a uh, records retention or a destruction date based on the type of record um, and so forth. And so through this process, RCI cataloged approximately 3,250 boxes of inactive records. So these are boxes of documents that were being maintained at the district warehouse um, that were ineligible for destruction. And then we'll look at on this next uh, slide, this is a chart that shows the, uh, based on the date eligible for destruction, this is the allocation of those 3,250 boxes. Um, so um, what you can see, you know, as of, uh, this was in August or so, 2023, the, the majority of the boxes, you know, around 67 percent you know relate to the last five years so they're on the the more recent side there's still a small number of boxes that go back to uh prior to 2000 or you know earlier um, but it, it's you know i think that the uh the observation that you know we had was that it was improving there's there's less of the older documents that are still um you know, sitting in the warehouse and that there is a, a more automated process that is in place. Um, and, you know, I think that talking to individuals within human resources, um, you know, this was a, a function of, you know, needing to 
uh, you know, probably should have happened sooner as far as, you know, the, the, uh, digitizing the records and, and, you know, getting, uh, an automated process, you know, especially with the, the recent growth that's been experienced by the districts. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, I think a, a function of growth and then, and something that probably should have happened a little bit, a little bit sooner, um, uh, based on number of documents that are being accumulated. So RCI also cataloged all of the documents that are still considered active records, which were 4,600 boxes. Um, so these are documents that are uh, being maintained but are, are not yet eligible for destruction. Uh, so these were cataloged with the uh, description of the, of the documents, um, the, uh, the year that they're eligible for destruction into that uh, electronic database uh, that we were talking about earlier. And then in addition to the cataloging of the, the records uh, in or around 2020, uh, the district also started contracting with DocuNav Solutions uh, to start the process of uh, digitizing, imaging a lot of the hard copy records uh, that were being maintained. Uh, so uh, I know, for example, we were reviewing documents through the DocuNav database with respect to the human resources, you know, the hiring practices, the employee compensation. So they're uh, it's still in progress, but there's, uh, you know, ongoing efforts to, to, to digitize a lot of those documents. Uh, so they're not just, um, maintained in a hard copy format. And then I wanted to circle back to, uh, what I mentioned earlier with the respect to some of the documents, uh, related to the candidate interviews, which, um, you know, we had a few different, um, I guess, sources of, of information that appeared to show that those were being uh, destroyed, at least at some campuses, um, you know, without being maintained for two years as required by TSLAC. Uh, so these are, you know, we're talking about the uh, TSLAC requires the supporting documents um, related to a candidate interview. So this could be ranking sheets or notes. Um, and those are to be maintained uh, for two years. Um, as one example, uh, we received a documentation that in August of 2022, a candidate who interviewed for a position uh, was informed that the ranking sheets have been destroyed uh, because the position had been filled by a lateral transfer. Uh, so this was a open records request. Um, and, you know, I think that this was a situation where there was um, you know, based on our discussions with human resources department, you know, there was, um, uh, it wasn't intentional in the sense that they, you know, what we were informed was that they were unaware that they should have been keeping the interview sheets if the position was filled, you know, through another method. Um, you know, I think that the way that we interpret the TSLAC, uh, records retention of requirements is that if the, those interviews you know, are conducted, that there is still the uh, requirement to maintain those for, for two years. Um, and, and again, based on uh, several different sources uh, and, uh, you know, it was common practice um, for at least some campuses prior to 2022 uh, to destroy the interview ranking sheets um, once a candidate was, was selected. And, we also you know, noted that based on our review of the document destruction logs and looking at the description of records um, for those, you know, active and inactive records, you know, there, we didn't see anything that indicated that there were uh, you know, campus interview records that were being maintained. So that, that was, you know, further kind of corroborated the, uh, the observation that, that these were at least again, no, we're not saying this happened in all instances, but there was at least uh, some recurring practices of, of those being destroyed prior to the, the two years um, as required under the TSLAC records retention uh, requirements. So this, this is our uh, findings related to the, the board governance uh, scope of work. Um, so we, the first part of this, um, you know, is really 
conducted during phase one. So we interviewed uh, five board members, which included the the five board members that were there, you know, in March, April, 2023, that um, you know wished to speak with us. Um, so as part of those discussions, we uh, discussed the, the board governance practices. We also reviewed the uh, the team operating procedures, uh, which pertains to the board and the superintendent and encompasses the uh, board policies as well as the, the code of ethics. Code of ethics. Uh, we reviewed for the five-year period, the board meeting agenda, the minutes, packets and videos. Um, and we also reviewed the board committee uh, structure, the, the meeting frequency and, and kind of specifically the, uh, the board committees and their role within the, the board governance structure. For the, the summary of findings, um, you know, first, we observed and, and became aware that the, the TEA and the Texas Rangers investigations um, that were open from 2020 to 2023. Uh, so we uh, determined that as many as eight investigations had been opened uh, by TEA. And uh, it is, we, we don't have you know, information as far as uh, the details of all of those, but it, it's our understanding that, you know, at least Certain of those pertain to issues involving uh, one or more uh, board governance related issues. Um, we also were aware from uh, you know, media articles about an investigation that had been opened by the Texas Rangers pertaining to an issue involving uh, board governance. Uh, so we did not investigate you know, any of the, uh, the areas that were pending investigation, um, you know, as a precaution to you know, make sure that we didn't inter interfere with any kind of active investigation being conducted by an external agency or regulatory body. Um, the, other, the other finding um, that we uh, identified was that, uh, you know, through the, with respect to the, the board committees, um, you know, the, a large, uh, substantial portion of the discussion and the review and deliberation for um, board meeting agenda items, you know, actually occurs during the board committee meetings. And, and then as a, as a result of that, um, there's situations where, you know, some board members express concern about, you know, if they're not on a committee that's, you know, involved in deliberating an issue, when it comes to the regular board meeting, there's, uh, you know, may be placed on the consent agenda item. There's limited discussion, and, and there's really, you know, situations where they feel that they don't have, uh, you know, enough information or sufficient information to make an informed decision. So that was, um, you know, one of the things that was expressed by um, a few different board members, and, and you know, based on our review of the the committee meeting minutes as well as the the regular board meeting minutes you know there there is uh, it is the case that more of the deliberation um, you know if there is deliberation it would be more likely to happen at the committee meetings um, as opposed to the regular board committee meetings now that's not the case for all items and um, certain ones are required to be deliberated by the full board but um, there were some items that that was that issue was was raised by board members. The final scope of work uh, that we're going to talk about is the uh, the purchasing practices and procedures. So as part of our review of this scope of work, uh, we first started by reviewing the district's um, purchasing policies uh, and then the procedures manual, uh, which is essentially uh, the guide that um, you know, provides the, uh, the guidelines for impl implementing and adhering to those policies. Um, we also looked at the revisions to the policies during the review period. Uh, we selected a sample of over 50 purchases um, that we identified for further review. So for those uh, that we selected for further review, we, we looked at the competitive bidding method and the associated records as far as uh, RFP, RFQ, um, solicitation of quotes, the, the board authorizations uh, for the contract awards. 
Uh, we reviewed the contract documents, purchase orders, invoices, um, and the goal was to evaluate compliance with the district's uh, purchasing policies and procedures. The, the first observation uh, that I wanted to highlight, um, the district policy CVA local and CVB local, uh, those two policies were revised in April 2022, uh, such that the superintendent or the superintendent, superintendent's designee uh, shall chair the administrative review committee uh, for the selection of construction managers and professional services firms involved involving facilities construction. Uh, so, so previously, uh, there was an administrative review committee. Uh, so this was changed such that the superintendent or the superintendent's designee is uh, included as the chair of that committee um, in, in serving in um, at least one case as a evaluator as well as um, chairing the committee. And this was approved through the, uh, the, board pol the policy uh, board committee uh, and then ultimately approved by the, by the board as a whole uh, in April 2022. Um, we had a, a few uh, observations, uh, areas that we reviewed further that related to the, uh, the HVAC and the LED lighting purchases um, that were uh, purchased with ESSER funds in 2023. So in March of 2023, we identified there were three, three purchases uh, totaling approximately 7.8 million. Um, and this was a combination of, of HVAC and, and lighting upgrades um, and included contracts with three different firms, uh, Verigi uh, for 4.7 million, and then that one was uh, primarily HVAC. The Performance Services Inc. for 2.4 million, which was a, a combination of HVAC, and then, but mostly lighting. And then the E3 Integral Solutions uh, for uh, 0.8 million, um, that was entirely uh, lighting upgrades. Uh, so first, uh, you know, with respect to federal funds, so these were obtained through quotes from uh, purchasing cooperatives. There is a disclaimer on uh, each of those purchasing cooperatives that were used where for uh, federal funds for purchases over 250000 there is a, uh, a pricing analysis or competitive bidding requirement that um, the purchasing cooperative, you know, does not satisfy those requirements with respect to the $250,000 or more. So there's the disclaimer essentially requires an additional pricing analysis to be done. So, you know, instead of just taking uh, one quote from a firm, you know, that has a contract with a purchasing cooperative, there would still need to be some kind of uh, a pricing comparison, pricing analysis. Uh, so what we we determined was that the district uh, did perform pricing analysis for these, um, and and the way that that was done was um, you know one comparing uh, quotes to each other. Um, so for example, the the quote provided by uh, by Verigi for HVAC was compared to the quote for uh, Performance Services Inc. and E3, which was HVAC and lighting, and, and you know these are at different campuses. Uh, they also uh, solicited additional quotes um, for the LED lighting um, with, a, I think there was a, a two-day window to submit quotes, and there was one one quote, or actually, sorry, two quotes were received. One was the, um, the E3, um, and then the other was the, the Excel uh, Energy. But the, I guess the, the point that we were trying to make here you know, there was pricing analysis, but it did, it did appear that the pricing analysis was was not necessarily you know apples to apples as far as um, you know. I think a, a best practice here would be to uh, you know go out for a formal um, RFP or RFQ to you know get competitive pricing that is um, you know designed to give the district the the best value. So. Uh, you know, again, there, there was pricing analysis. Um, I think there was, uh, you know, some, some of the additional analysis was kind of done later in the process. Um, so, um, you know, but this was approved through an administrative committee. The, um, 
the finance committee and then ultimately the board. But that, that's you know, kind of going under the surface a little bit. Those were um, some of the observations we had with respect to that to that purchase. We noted that uh, prior to June of 2021, uh, that contract extensions um, were being approved administratively rather than a formal board approval. Uh, so these, this is talking about if there's a, a contract for a multi-year term that includes um, you know, language in the contract about extension. Um, when that extension is approved, it, it wasn't necessarily going to the board, but it was being approved by administration. You know, and this was again prior to June of 2021. Um, at that time, the uh, policy CH local was revised uh, to include that requirement to ensure that the board approved the contract extensions uh, for for vendors and, and third parties um, going forward. There was a, a purchase in November 2021 uh, for network firewall equipment uh, from MicroShare from 545,000 uh, that we were unable to identify the, the board approval. Uh, and this, I think, could be a situation where this was a contract extension that was uh, may not have been brought to the board, but um, we noted that as, as one of the exceptions um, in our review of the sample uh, transactions for further review. We also determined uh, from our selection of the sample uh, and, and review of those that there was a contract awarded to the vendor ADM group uh, for safety security audit services uh, for $49,479 that was in December, 2022. Uh, we determined that, that no other quotes were obtained, um, which would, uh, you know, for the, for the price amount and based on the, the purchasing policy that would have required you know, other quotes, um, especially if, if the, in this situation, the quote was not from a, a purchasing cooperative. We also identified a potential a conflict of interest uh, related to an employee or vendor. Um, and just to, to provide some background, and, and this is the information that's included uh, in the report number three draft that's been submitted to the board. Uh, from September 2021 to February 2022, um, based on uh, an open records request that we submitted to San Benito CISD, uh, we identified email communications between Dr. Carmen uh, who at that time was the superintendent at San Benito CISD um, with uh, an in individual that was the client relations director for ADM group. And the, the bullets here provide kind of a summary of those email communications, which there were about a hundred or so from within this five month period. Um, but one of the observations from our review is that Dr. Carmen assisted ADM group with business development activities, uh, which included planning an itinerary for the representative to visit South Texas, as well as um, you know, providing other types of information about you know, conferences to attend, um, uh, you know, guidelines with respect to, uh, you know, vendors interacting with, with board members, um, you know, connections, connecting this representative with other superintendents, you know, in the, in the region um, to provide a few examples. Um, the, uh, there was at least one instance where uh, the uh, representative from ADM group attended a conference uh, as a guest of Dr. Carmen uh, during this time period. Um, in, in around January or February of 2022, Dr. Carmen, uh, through email, requested that the ADM representative review his portfolio submission for his candidacy for the superintendent position at Socorro ISD. In February 2022, after Dr. Carmen was selected uh, for the position of superintendent at Socorro ISD, he uh, had an email uh, with the representative from ADM Group, where he discussed uh, the possible facilities analysis of the auxiliary gyms, which were also referred to as the multi-purpose buildings, 
uh, and that, that that work may be in store sooner rather than later. On March 22nd, 2022, this, this would have been within a week or so of Dr. Carmen officially starting his role as superintendent at Socorro ISD. Uh, the, the board authorized the solicitation for architectural consultant services for the 16 auxiliary gyms. Uh, so this was the, the same project that we referenced on the prior slide that was in that email discussion with uh, ADM group. From April 2nd to April 4th, 2022, Dr. Carmen, as well as uh, several board members, attended the NSBA conference in San Diego, uh, which also included the uh, attending an event hosted by ADM Group. April 7th, 2022, uh, there was, before the, the RFQ was um, sent out to solicit proposals, the scoring criteria. Uh, for the RFQ um, was revised such that the 20 points for uh, past experience with SISD was uh, removed and then reallocated. So there's 100 points that uh, the, were uh, typically used for scoring criteria for the construction and professional services related to construction projects. So in this situation um, at the request of Dr. Carmen, those points were removed and then reallocated. Um, we, we interviewed Dr. Carmen um, with respect to the change of criteria. Uh, what he informed us was that uh, based on, um, you know, a request or directive that he received from uh, members of the board executive committee prior to this meeting, uh, that there was uh, you know, members of the board executive committee who, you know, did not want the district to select firms that had been uh, previously selected as part of the bond program uh, for architectural services. And, and so uh, to, for him to implement that, you know, changing the scoring criteria such that the, you know, 20% of the points that are awarded to, you know, firms who have worked with the district in the past by removing those points, that would give the uh, firms who have not worked with the district previously, you know, an opportunity to to win that work. So that was April 7th, uh, which was shortly thereafter the RFQ went out to solicit proposals. Uh, before the the proposal window ended uh, on April 19th, 2022, uh, this is when the board approved uh, CBA local policy, which um, was revised to include, as we talked about earlier, the, the superintendent or the superintendent's designee being added as the, the chair of the administrative AD committee. On April 25th, 2020, uh, the administrative review committee uh, met for the first time to evaluate proposals. Um, and based on uh, discussions that we had with individuals who participated in that meeting that you know Dr. Carmen uh, shared with the members of the committee um, the uh, you know the the board you know what the board executive committee members had had shared with him about not wanting to uh, select any of the firms that had worked with the district under the under the 2017 bond program. Um, on April 29th, 2022, the board met, I'm sorry, not the board, the Administrative Review Committee met for a second time to finalize the evaluation uh, for the uh, 10 proposals that were received, which of those 10, um, it was determined that, that eight of those had worked with the district previously as part of the bond program, and then uh, two of them had not, which one of them was ADM Group, which received the, the highest score, uh, an aggregate score of 97 across the four uh, evaluators. Um, and I mentioned earlier that there was, you know, at least one of the examples where the, the chair of the administrative review committee also participates in the evaluation. So we did confirm that, that in this case, Dr. Carmen was one of the four individuals that evaluated uh, the proposals for the 10 firms um, and also uh, signed the, the conflict of interest um, acknowledgments and, and so forth as one of the um, participants in that committee. And then May 17th, 2022, 
Uh, the contract was awarded by the district to ADM Group for an amount not to exceed $100,000 for the architectural consultant services, um, which was approved uh, administratively. Um, and about six months later, uh, this was the contract that we talked about earlier. That was the safety security audit was then approved uh, for just under 50000 So. Um, based on, on the information that we reviewed and included in the uh, forensic audit report number three, um, you know, our recommendation was that the board review this information with, with legal counsel um, and, and regarding any, any next steps. And the next section is the, the recommendations. Um, I'm going to stop for a second and get some water and make sure that if there's any questions that um, you'd like me to answer before I address the recommendations, if we can do that now. Yeah, I have questions. Sure. Okay. Uh, before we get to the recommendations, uh, I have a, a number of notes from the previous slide, but your last part of the presentation I guess we'll take precedence when we discuss the purchasing and uh, procurement process in the in your emails I mean in, in this uh, document where he procured ADM uh, you mentioned February 28th 2022 uh, there was an email sent between Carmen and uh, Grijalva this was prior to him signing his contract here correct uh, February 28th, yeah, 2022. Um, so he would have been named as the, the loan he finalist. Would have been named. Yeah, I'm not sure if he had, had, if the contract was signed at that point or not, but um, yeah, that was, that, at that point in time, he was still the superintendent at uh, San Benito CISD, but had been named as the loan finalist at Socorro ISD. Okay, well, the email, it started, uh, dear, dear Grijalva, just to follow up with a, on a couple of items. Number one, regarding the golf tournament, I apologize for my previous communication. I realize you had gone through the process of obtaining sponsorship, and this is the golf tournament in San Benito. Um, I had concerns because there were some in the SB community who were, who were tying Vicky to Lyford, and it's causing some minor challenges. I think that's squashed now, so. Uh, if you are able to sponsor some level, it would be appreciated. If not, I would understand it was my doing. Uh, do you have any information about what was the challenge with Vicky and Lifert and what was squashed? Uh, nothing specifically. Um, you know, I, I think that the ADM group did do some sort of architectural work with uh, with Lyford ISD and, and maybe an athletic facility that was finished in the last year or so. Um, but that's that's the only thing I'm aware of with respect to the ADM group and Lyford ISD. Okay. And, and they're referring to Vicki Pettis, correct? I I don't know that for certain, but that would that would probably be my guess. She was a trustee there at Lyford at the time. And the second part of the email, was says, regarding Socorro, our district, I'd love to have you and Ben, and I guess that would be the president of the company, come visit us once I'm in district full-time. I have already had a board member express some concerns on elementary multi-purpose buildings to some of our facility, and so some of our facility analysis may be in store sooner rather than later. And then feel free to share this with Ben. I don't think... Um, then there's an O, oh, have his email handy. I look forward to hearing from you, Nate Carmen, EDB. Uh, did you identify who the board member was that reached out to uh, Mr. Carmen? Um, not specifically. I know that Dr. Carmen mentioned that he had one-on-one uh, -on -one discussions with, with the, uh, the board members. Um, you know, I think that it was likely the 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 members, um, you know, the, they're no longer on the board, but the um, uh, 
uh, Trustee Morales and uh, Mena that and I think had mentioned that they were, um, you know, wanting to include the restrooms um, into those 16 auxiliary gyms. Um, but I know that, you know, there were, um, there were four board members, I think, and three that opposed it, but there were four that you know, all were in favor of, of adding the restrooms to those 16 auxiliary gyms. So, you know, I can't say for certain, but that's, um, you know, kind of my understanding of, of who he was referring to. Okay. Uh, you included uh, Edward Mena's and uh, David Morales's uh, campaign contributions in the packet that you provided to us. And, and I believe yeah. you, go, go ahead, sir. Yeah, we, we, we included uh, just as a, um, you know, as part of the timeline, we also noted that in uh, in April of 2023, uh, that there was uh, campaign um, donations that were paid from individuals who were affiliated with ADM Group to uh, the campaigns of uh, uh, trustees Morales and, and Mena. When you say affiliated, you employed or uh, the the individual was uh, certainly employed with ADM Group in 2021, um, but I'm, I'm not sure if they were employed at that time. It's okay. you know I, I think it was a situation where construction company that has um, you know different um, subsidiaries. It's hard to really tell you know which company they're directly affiliated or they're directly employed with but i think you know safe to say affiliated for sure but you you did uh, identify that they were affiliated in some manner with adm correct correct okay um originally this contract uh well this contract with adm was approved outside of the board right it was approved correct. administratively it was, uh, Correct. Okay, and this is a construction contract that was approved outside of the board, correct? It was a it was a contract for professional services, um, specifically the architectural consultant services for um, you know facilities assessment, but also design services for the uh, the sixteen auxiliary gyms. Which yeah, it, it, the PO refers to it as a uh, construction related purchase order and that would be a violation of the policy or district policy to approve con uh, construction contracts outside of the board correct and and, I, and okay. I know there's an attachment in here too sorry from ressa and uh i guess it was th to the board where it was supposed to be a construction contract and was supposed to be presented to the board is that correct the, so the, the original memorandum that was prepared by the uh, the former CFO, um, Mr. Reza, it was you know it, part of that standard uh, memorandum that it, it's addressed uh, or it, it's you know references board approval. Um, you know, my understanding is that there was some internal you know discussions between Dr. Carmen um, and and Mr. Reza about you know whether the contract was to be brought to the board for approval. Um, you know, it's also my understanding that there may be different interpretations to the policies with, you know, which with respect to uh, CH local and, and CVA local, um, because there is, you know, CH local, um, you know, re doesn't require, you know, contracts under 100,000 to be brought to the board. Uh, CVA local, you know, there's an implication that if if CVA local is applicable, that all contracts are approved or presented to the board for approval. Applicable in the sense that if it's a construction contract, it has to be brought before the board, correct? That I think that would be a legal question that you would probably need to confer with, uh, you know, the board legal counsel for on on that question specifically and uh dr carmen did sign a no conflict of interest statement uh, um interest statement and non-disclosure statement correct references transaction correct right yes all of the members of the evaluation committee um 
you know, are required to sign the, the no conflict of interest disclosure form. In, 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 going back to your past audit, when you did San Benito, you mentioned E3 being involved and then they come up over here and 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 then this is part of the procurement. Let me get the right page here. E3 is brought in. Uh, actually, we were initially informed that there was no price comparison or, or price matching, and then somehow later they got another one, but uh, it was referred to as it was not apples to apples, even though the second company came in lower, correct? Uh, it was Energy Group. Yeah, so there was a right, another quote was obtained from, from Excel uh, Energy that was... Um, you know, about half of the price. I think that the um, administrative committee reviewed these, the the two proposals, and I think what was, you know, the conclusion that was drawn is that the the price for that second quote from Excel, um, you know, did include all of the anticipated costs, and and you know that there was likely going to be additional costs, you know, down the road, um, and so. That was that was part of the reason why we said it wasn't apples to apples, but we we were also referring to the you know comparing the uh, three proposals from E3 at Verigi and the Performance and Services Inc. Comparing those three to each other um, because those are you know included uh, you know just different scopes of work, different campuses. You had HVAC scopes of work. You had lighting. You had exterior lighting, indoor lighting. So the you know versus if if the district had gone out for an RFP for uh, those services and could have received prices specific to what was the you know the district's need, I think that would have provided a better um, pricing comparison um, as far as retaining the best value. And then we go to the next one, which was uh, Ver Verigi and Performance Services. And when I when I reviewed your your report here. They didn't use the apples to apples comparison, right? It was just performance services was selected. They had the prices. They had the two. But so that that was the the situation where right, Verigi, uh, their proposal for HVAC was compared to the proposal for performance services, which was a combination of HVAC and lighting. So those two were compared against each other, um, and E three as well for. Uh, I think there was a comparison of, you know, the cost per light uh, fixture. Um, but again, it was, you know, exterior versus interior and a few other differences. But there, there, there was, um, you know, I think that the point we made that there, there, there was pricing analysis. Um, it just, it, it wasn't necessarily, you know, apples to apples. It wasn't necessarily apples to apples. Okay. Yeah, because my concern, you know, we, we're looking at ADM. And uh, I know E3 was mentioned in, a, in your audit back with San Benito. Uh, I did the research on performance services. They're, they have their own federal investigation that was ongoing down there. Um, they were under federal investigation for what bribing uh, elected officials. And we have them here now. They brought them up from the valley. And I'm, I'm starting to see a concern that if more than one company was steered this way and the rules were manipulated to allow them access into our district. Um, and that's what I'm getting from this document. Uh, anybody, on, uh, I'll stop on this section because I do have other questions from the previous part, but I don't know if anybody else wants to address the purchasing section. Yeah, I do have a clarifying question. Mr. Kastner, you mentioned at, that Dr. Carmen mentioned that he got directed by the board to modify scoring criteria. Were you able to um, actually speak to that executive committee uh, to confirm if that was correct or not? So the um, information that we received through our interview with Dr. Carmen was that during the um, executive committee um, meeting that those board members who are members of the executive committee uh, 
you know, communicated, um, for lack of, of, of a better term, to Dr. Carmen that they did not want to select, you know, any of the firms that had been selected previously under the 2017 bond program and, and more specifically, any of the firms that were, you know, in, in any way associated with the, the former um, COO. And so they didn't mention, as far as I know, anything about changing the scoring criteria. That was something that uh, Dr. Carmen mentioned, you know, in his capacity as far as um, implementing what was communicated to him by the executive committee, uh, changing the scoring criteria was something that, you know, that was an area that he could do to implement the, um, what was communicated from the executive committee. And then we did, we did not speak with um, the, at least two of the members of the executive committee. Um, these were members who are no longer on the board, but also we were unable to get in contact with when we tried previously. Um, so, you no. Know, to answer the second part of your question, we, we have not spoke with the members of the executive committee, at least the two that, um, you know, I think were being referenced. Thank you. And you answered the next part of my question was the members of that executive committee are no longer here with us. The other question that I have is you mentioned that was there was a conflict in interpretation of policy. At that time, did they get legal advice? I know that you mentioned a prior chief financial officer that mentioned, yes, it has to go to the board. Did they ever get legal advice that if it should go to the board or not? Um, my understanding is that there were discussions, but I may defer, I don't want to overstep by, you know, sharing if there was legal advice, you know, I, I don't want to speak out of turn as far as that communication, but I, I do know that there, there were, um, some discussions about, you know, whether the, with legal counsel about whether or not this should be, um, presented to the board. And, and I think that the the concern was that the the uh, contract amount, which was um, you know not to exceed a hundred thousand, the purchase order amount was ninety thousand. That it was getting close towards the the hundred thousand dollar amount, which you know if there was a change order to increase that amount, that would push it over the hundred thousand. Where there's a there is a um, requirement under CH local to the contract must be approved by the board. Do you know uh, legal counsel that was in place at that time? Um, I, I believe it was the uh, same legal counsel um, that is currently with um, uh, Mr. Blanco. Mr. Blanco, could you answer that question? And if you can't, I understand. Thank you, Board President Nada, members of the board, and Ms. Macias, and I appreciate Mr. Kasner's um, being careful on that question. It's something I can discuss with you in closed session. I don't want to waive attorney-client privilege on that issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Kessler, you mentioned on the executive team when they met that they decided not to pick, uh, I guess, companies that had done business with us can the executive team actually make that decision without going out to the board? I think that that gets into a, a question as far as the, the board governance, um, as far as, you know, the board's role, you know, in, in so influencing the vendor selection process. Um, and so I, I think it's, um, you know, that, that was one of the reasons we, we reviewed that issue because, and we have a recommendation about the, um, the policy with respect to CBA local, um, just to, you know, ensure that the, the board doesn't have influence over the selection of specific vendors. And I, I think that, you know, those types of conversations, um, you know, get approached that type of, um, you know, they are headed, headed in that direction. Um, I know you're getting, we're getting into the direction now that 
did he have the did, did he operate outside of policy did were actions taken outside and were contracts being steered to, uh, for the district or in favor of certain companies um, it would be like a recommendation well I guess you can't make the recommendation if an outside agency were to review this your your findings here and it's pretty substantial you go back into the emails um, do you have a substantial document here strictly on this last conversation that we've been having here on everything that took place and reviewing it um, is something we'd have to discuss in executive fears but right so yeah I think our our, uh, our role was to present the the facts to the board yes, and sir. then um, with the recommendation that the board uh, you know seek advice from legal counsel um, regarding you know next steps if any okay if we're done with the purchasing part I can I want to ask on the other stuff would it be safe to say that as soon as Dr. Carmen got the position here or even well before in that process, he obviously got here, changed uh, the policy, but then obviously he was already talking to, like you stated earlier, two board members about the ADM and the construction or that architecture process of it, correct? But th those two board members are no longer here. You tried reaching out to confirm. They obviously haven't answered that. They, they never reached out to you, correct? Right. When we tried to to interview them as part of phase one, we were unable to connect with them. Um, and then, yeah, just the, the one clarification, you know, with respect to the change of the policy for CVA local, that that was the, you know, the policy committee and then the board approved it as far as, you know, the, the way that that was changed. So I just wanted to make that clarification, but that, that would have happened in, in April of 2022, um, which would have been, you know, but I think Dr. Carmen started his tenure as superintendent on uh, March 14th of 2022. Okay, I just, I mean, I guess the way I'm hearing it, it seems like even before he received this contract between him and these other two previous board members, it was already pre-planned how this was gonna be staged. That's the way I'm seeing, that's my perception. I just, would would that be safe to say? I. I don't think that we have, um, I think what the, the email showed that there was at least, you know, one email exchange between Dr. Carmen and ADM group where they talked about the facilities assessment for the auxiliary gyms. Um, and there was a potential meeting, um, you know, once Dr. Carmen was in El Paso that was referenced. Um, I, I don't know if that occurred um, but yeah, I think as far as the, the February 28th, 2022 email exchanges, I think there's discussion about the facility assessment, um, work with the auxiliary gyms at Socorro ISD that was, um, that was specifically mentioned. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Um, it. Uh, I didn't get the slide number. I'm going back to page six on your uh, <coughs> forensic audit report number two. Uh, part G, it says uh, analysis of employee receiving multiple stipends. Uh, and I'm looking, uh, I'll, I'll go with the last year, the 2022. You have, uh, you showed like 16 employees re receiving six stipends, 39 employees receiving what is it five stipends do you have any examples of that or uh, I didn't see anything in the supplemental material that would say yeah this person had these X examples of stipends it seems to be a lot My, of course the majority are one or two stipends like and I can see that but did it yeah carry? and um, I know that we <coughs> said some of the examples were um, and I can might have if I reshare my screen here Uh, is this the the table that you're referring to? There it is. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. So we 
we looked at it, and I, I don't recall any of the specific names, um, but we, we have the data, uh, if, if that's something the, that the board is, is wanting to see. But uh, typically the ones where there were more, you know, like when we get into five, six, seven, eight stipends, you know, those were um, athletic stipends. Um, we, as part of this, and I should have mentioned this, this table, we did exclude the, the you know, the non, um, like the travel and the cell phone, those are excluded, the extra duty pay, just because those are, you know, not really, well, the, the extra duty pay is not set, you know, within the compensation plan. It's not really a known, you know, uh, it's kind of an on as needed basis. So these are, you know, just in reference to the, the annual stipends that are, you know, fixed per the compensation plan. So those are going to be the athletic stipends, the performing arts stipends, um, you know, the, those, but I think that generally the athletic stipends are probably going to be responsible for ones where there's, you know, six or seven or eight, nine received by one person that an individual is involved in difference of um, <clears throat> athletic events. I had a concern because in the TEA investigation, they identified uh, four teachers who were actually double dipping on, on stipends and performing their regular job. And I, I know some of these, when you start getting to six or seven stipends, it, were they the type that interfered with their work? And that's what my concern was there. Uh, the next section on the stipend, DEA, I guess, of course, that was identified by TEA as a violation by this district. Uh, on page, well, let's see, then, on page seven of, the, of the, your document, uh, you did identify two stipends that I do not recall being identified by TEA. It was the physician stipend that was paid prior to ever being approved or being, um, that we identified stipend payment totaling $4,000, well, which pay up prior to the board's review and authorization. And uh, what was the other one? Sparta Academy Coordinator. Those are two stipends that I did not see in the TEA re report as being identified, but you identified two more. And, and those are the, the ones that those were positions that were added in the middle of the, uh, the school year. So they, they were, uh, for example, with the physician stipend, uh, we noted that it was four thousand dollars that was paid in fiscal year 2020 um, and then it was officially adopted as part of the compensation plan as far as the board review um, in FY 2021 so that it was a you know a timing of the stipend was being added um, prior to the the board's review of the, the compensation plan on the as part of the budget process. As that was a concern I brought up back then in 2021. Um, on, on page eight of your document, you're talking about benchmarking analysis indicating fewer FTE relative to enrollment. Can you go back and explain that? Sure, so that analysis, we, um, let me see if I can find the, the slide here. Um, so based on information that's submitted to the, the TEA each year where, um, you know, school districts across Texas submit information as far as their full-time employees, um, and including, you know, by category, by position. Um, and then obviously the enrollment information is also available. So we compared, uh, the, the district to 22 other, uh, school districts, um, in, but on a normalized basis, you know, meaning to, to get it to be an apples to apples, um, because obviously larger school districts are going to have more staff. Um, but we analyzed it based on the full time employees divided by the number of students. So the, the staff per student. Um, and so what we determined was that on a normalized per enrollment basis, uh, the, the number of full-time employees at Socorro ISD was, was lower, uh, sorry, the number of full-time employees per student for Socorro ISD was lower than the other 22 
school districts for FY 2022, and then it was the, the second lowest in FY 2023. Uh, for clarification, the FTEs, that would be a, your professional staff, your teachers, your educators? Correct, so th this would exclude uh, the substitutes and, and some of the, the part-time or the, the hourly, um, you know, employees that are paid hourly. This would just be the, yeah, the full-time uh, employees. Uh, can you give us an example of the number? Because uh, it says we were the second lowest um, uh, FTE per student. Can you compare us to the one that had, you know, I guess the best ratio of FTEs per student? I, I don't see the, the numbers, how we compare them. Yeah, so if, if you go to, um, in the draft report, we have a table. On page 36. And I can. I don't believe everybody has a copy up here. Yeah, let me see if I can. Here you. I'm going to try to share my screen. Are you uh, able to see this? Chart? Yes. Okay, there we go. Um, so this is the, the chart that's on page 36 of the draft report where we're comparing uh, for the 22 other school districts. Uh, so this first three columns is for fiscal year 2022, and then this next three are fiscal year 2023. So for each uh, fiscal year, we have the enrollment, and then we have the number of uh, full-time employees and from there, we can calculate the, the students per FTE, which is um, you know, the opposite of the way I described it earlier, but it's essentially the same thing. So in this case, the larger the number of students per FTE, another way of saying that would be the fewer number of full-time employees per student. It's just, it looks weird with when you have the small decimals that so we showed it this way, but the, Conclusion is the same. So the so for example, your question about the next uh, highest was Eagle Pass ISD, um, and then Westlake ISD, then El Paso ISD. Those were um, second, third, and fourth in FY22. Okay, yeah, and I'm, I'm glad we're able to compare it with the other districts here. It's And then you have one for the substitutes. That's uh... correct. So with with the the data um, that we referenced for the the substitute, um, share that. And this, this comes on uh, page uh, page 40 of the draft report, number two. So the, the financial data that's submitted uh, as part of the, the PEAMS data to TEA, uh, object code 6112 uh, is the, the salaries and wages for substitute teachers. Um, and then object code 6119 is the salaries wages for uh, teachers and other, and so then we can, you know, use that to normalize the the salaries and wages for substitutes as a percentage of the total. Um, and the reason we did it that way is because the the number of substitutes is not 
you know, shared with, it's, I don't think that's available through the, it's not reported to the TEA. So we were kind of working with the, the data that we had as far as to being able to compare it to, to other school districts. So, you know, we normalized it as a substitute compensation uh, as a percentage of total compensation. And so you can see for FY 2022, which is the most recent data that's available on the TEA's website until next month, uh, Socorro ISD had the highest with 3.1% of substitute uh, compensation as a percentage of total. Um, and then Isleta uh, was, was a close second, 3.08%. Okay, I just need a clarification on that, and then we uh, see that those numbers. On um, slide 18, I actually wrote that down there, slide 18. Uh, fund balance. Can, uh, can you explain what goes into the fund balance again? I was trying to catch up on that. So these are the, the funds that are available in the, the bank account for each campus as of June 2022. What is so, maintained in that bank account? What, what types of funds? Where do they get so the, Right. So these are going to be the, the incoming deposits relate to um, the fundraising activities. Uh, donations, you know, that are received by the campus throughout the school year, um, and then the disbursements that go out of those funds are the, uh, you know, the associated disbursements related to um, activities, you know, t-shirts, um, events, campus events. There's kind of a, a wide range of, of different you know, uses for those funds, um, but essentially that's the the balance is you know, as of this point in time, you know, this is the available balance in the, in the account. So this is fundraising and donations. Um, I'll use Mombat High School, that stands out there. $342,000, it was in their fund balance as of six of 22. Um, that's fundraising and donations, correct? No other? I'm just trying for, to clarify that. Right. So that's that's the 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 campus activity funds. Um, right. So it, it, it's not going to include, for example, the the salaries and yeah. Uh, your, that's that's part of the um, overall general funds. Okay. And this would include, like, say they they had a fundraiser. All the money would go in there, and then it divide to the different organizations after that, right? That, Correct, yeah, and, the, and the, there are some, yeah, there's transfers that happen, you know, we, we noticed or observed that there was, uh, you know, transfers between campuses, I guess when there's like shared activities, and then there's, I think there was around three million or so of transfers from the campus funds, you know, back to the, the district's um, general fund. Okay. And the campuses average about 51,000, you said? That was the average fund balance across the, the 49 campuses as of June 2022. So the, the, the range was anywhere from $800 to 342,000. I have a question. Who, who provided you this information? So this was information that we uh, received from the, the school books um, data, the financial reports from the software that's used by the, uh, by the campuses. So we extracted that and then, um, and, and also, you know, did a spot check where we can you know, reconcile back to the bank statements for, you know, for example, if a, a campus's bank statement would have the balance and we, we would reconcile to that, which um, I think is a process that the finance department does as well. But um, yeah, this was extracted from the, the school books software. Okay. Um, I don't know. I just have 
Maybe I'm wrong, but El Dorado ninth grade isn't that currently Pebble Hills? Um. Okay, I, I mean, I just I just want to make sure we're clearing things up because when I look at the date, I'm pretty sure Pebble Hills we already had a graduating class oh, way well before 2022. So when I I guess when I look at the information that you were given, is it actually accurate? Because I mean. I'm pretty sure in 2022 they graduated more than just 500. I'm not saying it's your own, and I think it's maybe the information we gave you is not accurate. It's not depicting what's correct. So, I mean, is there a way that we can, the board can be provided with that? You know, I guess the district, it doesn't make sense. So I do question, were you given the whole information correctly and accurately? Yeah, and it could be the case that the the name of the account has changed with um, when Pebble Hills, you know, became, um, yeah, I mean, because I, I, I know we have, you know, the account balance and then each account had a, a name and it could be the case that the name changed and we just need to reflect that. Um, but I'll, I'll double check that and see with the Eldorado ninth grade if, if that's, because even if you change, um, even if you change the name to Pebble Hills, the number of students is not accurate. Right. So the number of students we would have pulled based on data for the campus reports. But again, if the campus name changed, then that would impact the number of students. From so, I, I think I, I think we what we need to do in our end is to confirm that the the account. You know, it, my guess is it changed, um, it, you know, to encompass the new school at some point, and we just need to reflect that name in this chart. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and of course, right after that, you lack of visibility in the campus funding reports, uh, something we have to address later to uh, account for who, who's putting the money in there and where it's coming from. Um, uh, slide twenty one. And it was page 12 in your report. Travel expense expenditures for an individual not employed by the district. Uh, the person, Hector Madrigal, tra uh, traveled with the district and he was not an employee and it was paid for by $1,558 when they went to San Diego in April. And I think you also made a note that he was serving as an assistant superintendent in San Benito CISD during Carmen's tenure there. When was this identified and paid back that uh, he was not an employee? So the, the conference was uh, April 2nd through 4th of 2022. Um, and then it was repaid uh, it was invoiced on July 20th, and then the receipt for the, the repayment of the uh, amount was July 29th, 2022. July 29th, it was paid back to the district? Correct, for the, the $1,558 for the um, registration fee and the, the airfare. Who authorized the expenditure in the first place? Do you have that document? Um, not, I do, but not, off, I'd have to okay, that's pull fine. it up, um, but it, I know there was a, a purchase order that was authorized that referenced, um, the approval for it with the understanding that Mr. Madrigal was, was the, um, I guess, pending, uh, employee, uh, you know, was what was mentioned in the, on the purchase order. Question on that. Wasn't, you mentioned that an employee contract was offered, so it was brought to the board for approval? Because that is a cabinet level position. 
Correct. Yeah, this was uh, a cabinet level position that was approved by the board and the contract, um, the appointment contract had been, been offered. Um, so yeah, th there would have been board approval, I guess, of, of the contract probably sometime in March of 2022. Thank you. I don't, I don't recall this contract coming up. Did okay. It was the, I believe he was one of the uh, deputy superintendents initially hired and then uh, for some reason declined the position. He could not come here. No, because I know. That, um, oh, there you go. Chief of HR. Okay. Clarification on that. That was Dr. Gonzalez who helped clarify. Uh, when we discuss idea B, formula grants and special education department, uh, you received a, a number of interviews uh, discussing their concerns with the, uh, the special ed department, am I correct? Correct, yeah, they, and, and primarily, yeah, these were former employees that had, had worked with the district in the uh, special education department, you know, within, on average, I would say the last two to three years. And you, make, you made a recommendation that a, an external auditor specializing in special education, an RFQ should be, is recommended, right, for an external auditor for that position to in investigate further? Correct. Yeah, I, and I don't know if, if auditor is the right term, but a there are uh, consulting firms, you know, that um, have specialized knowledge in this area that do, you know, those kind of reviews with respect to the, um, you know, I operational type of reviews related to um, special education and IEP plans and. Uh, you know, benchmarking and, and, and that sort of thing. But yeah, it, in, I would call it a general professional, or I would call it a uh, external review versus an external audit just because it may not be an audit firm necessarily, but um, that's, I guess, gets into semantics. So more of a program evaluation, correct? That's right, right. The It's a operational review and yeah, program evaluation I think is, a good way to put it. But they would also look at the deficiencies, correct? Correct, right. I think a, a if it's, yeah, that type of assessment would be uh, the ones that I've seen, you know, are designed to identify the both the, the strengths and then the areas for improvement and, you know, bring those um, to the board for, you know, to, to discuss and review. Thank you. Since we're on that topic, Ms. Perez, I know the board had approved an RQ for something very similar. I mean, that's been months. I mean, where do we stand on that? Or is that something intentional to delay? Thank you. Good evening, President Alhera, members of the board. My name is Vicky Perez, Chief Financial Officer for Socorro ISD. Uh, that was taken immediately after the board, and it was advertised in the newspapers. <coughs> um, since then, we have not received any responses. We've extended it until we do get some kind of response, but as of right now, we have absolutely zero responses on that. Mr. Blanco, at that point, is there anything that we can do to reach out to, I don't know, to say five? firms so that we're not in violation of anything since we're not getting a response? So when we do that, it does go through eBids and that does go to almost all of the people who will subscribe to services on eBids. So anybody who has ever submitted a bid, it does go to them. Have we already gone to that process? That's immediate. As soon as we put out the, the RFP or RFQ, it just automatically goes to anybody who has previously bid on anything else. Blanco, would it be 
inappropriate to call neighboring districts and ask them maybe for anybody that they've used and then for us to specifically reach out to the firms? Person, the person department can certainly do that, but I don't want to get off track from what we're discussing. Okay. If you want to have a, another meeting with a, an gotcha. agenda item specifically to address that issue and give some direction, um, suggestions to the administration, I would recommend that we do that. Um, but I think the goal should be to get through Mr. Kasner's report. Uh, just one more item. Uh, you, I know you identified the employee perception of favoritism and fear of retaliation. Um, there's not much more we can add to that, but it was identified in your audit that uh, it is a concern for the district and it may reflect on why we, our FTEs are lower compared to other districts. And I just want to make note of that. Mr. Castor, on uh, slide number 24, very bottom. So the third, you know, major point is, Sarah, there says, uh, we identified variances between the spending plan for ESSER 3. And the last one, of course, yeah, needs evolved over time, but lighting upgrades not included in July 2021. This is pre-approved by TEA. So the pre-approved by TEA, whatever that means, that does not have to come to the board? For, well, I don't, I don't believe so. Um, the, I, I know that the, the spending plan that was presented in that July 2021 public hearing uh, listed um, probably 35 categories of expenses. The, there was one that included HVAC for 10 million, but there wasn't anything that referenced the lighting upgrades. Um, I, I actually don't want to say for certain um, whether or not the TEA, you know, the, the forms that go to, I think they're called the, the justification uh, forms that are a TEA form. I'm not sure if those go to the board or not. Um, that'd probably be a, a question for the uh, federal programs director. Dr. Starkey's standing right in front of us. Sir. Yeah, since I've lost weight, I've been moving quicker. <laughs> um, good evening, um, President Nahara and members of the board. Um, the justification forms and when TEA pre-approval was required through the ESSER process are not um, necessary to come before this board for um, prior approval. If I could also just, um, I don't want to, like what Mr. Blanco said, I know that we don't want to get off track, but one other thing is that um, the July 2021 spending plan, um, like the plan that we had to submit, we largely stuck to the majority of that. But the other thing is that I was only required to bring that to public hearing one time. I wasn't, that, like the law said that it didn't have to come back um, repeatedly, however, um, as the needs evolved over time, it, it is true that the LED lighting wasn't in that at first, um, the vast majority of the things we've we've stuck to, and it kind of went along with some of the construction, like with the HVACs, with the water fountains, um, and that sort of thing. But pretty much, um, yeah, I didn't have to bring that back. Is all, and then it just, um, you know, we kind of furthered that in that direction. Is all hopefully, but it was allowable and pre-approved, and hopefully that's satisfactory. Okay. So E3 was not part of the original plan. It was added. Well, if you take L Ms. Macias, if you take the LED lighting in general, whether it was E3 or something else, yeah, that was that was um, an, a need that um, was identified at a later time than the three years back. Thank you, sir. Well, oh, just real quick. So after the original plan for ESSER 3 was identified, it was brought, I guess, to your attention that, hey, we LED lighting. Then we went to TEA to say, hey, is it yes or no? Is it good? Yeah, we had to get the uh, pre-approval from TEA because with the ESSER, one of the things on this, Mr. Castellano, is that normally federal grants, by and large, almost exclusively don't allow construction. ESSER was different. It did allow us to have construction projects, but they had to meet first off a justification within one of the, to tie it to the statute, which every activity needed that, but then the construction needed 
a pre-approval from TEA where we had to send something in. We did get that back and it was approved and uh, we've got that on file. And it's been, we've had those on file. I think I've had a couple of those. I've had that one on file for a couple of years now. Or maybe, well, yeah. no, the LED maybe about a year and a half. Okay. The HVAC and the water fountains probably a couple of years back. Okay. And what was the category that it was under? I, I think it was in here somewhere. That justified it through TEA? Um, it was like um, with renovations and um, renovations, you base it, I believe. Because it was um, upgrading, um, upgrading existing lighting and whatnot. Do we want to let him proceed with recommendations? I'm sorry? Do we want to let him proceed with recommendations, Mr. Castro? Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm done. I, I just clarified it. Thank you, Dr. Starkey. Mr. Kastner? And um, one thing I did want to mention, just to clarify, because I did notice there's a, a typo on this slide where it says that needs evolved over time and then additional guidance issues that should say guidance issued, meaning that additional guidance was issued by TEA and, and federal agencies about the how the funds could be used, which you know would have uh, impacted the uh, you know, some of the changes with respect to the spending plan. I'm going to skip to the recommendations. And we've listed these in the uh, draft two of the report uh, at the end of the executive summary, um, but there's 18 of them. We've talked about some of them at a high level, but just to kind of quickly go through them, and we, we've organized them by the, the scope of work. Um, but with respect to the employee compensation and stipends, um, you know, what we talked about, you know, we, we observed that the, the district has been doing, you know, annual uh, TASB pay studies. Um, so what we recommend uh, a consideration would be also looking at the, the staffing, the number of staff by position um, as part of that review. Not not the necessarily the TASB pay study, but just a review of staffing in addition to you know what TASB is doing, which is really more of you know salaries relative to to the market and making those recommendations as far as salary increases, but we're also looking at staffing levels. Um, we also recommend that when the annual compensation plan is presented to the board, that there be, whether it's a, you know, red line changes or just a summary of the changes, but, you know, with any pay grade adjustments um, or stipends that change name or amounts or added, those just, you know, be um, identified in a way that's you know, easy for the board to, to and um, and see what those those changes are because as, as we mentioned there's over 300 stipends um, you know a large number of pay grades as well that you know it's hard to to see those and and I do know that you know there was uh, we, we watched a few of the board workshops where you know there was a discussion of, of all of the revisions um, so what we're, we're really talking about as far as this recommendation is just a a document of those changes kind of in a summarized way to make it easy for the board to understand what's what's changed in the proposed compensation plan. Um, and then number three um, is is talking about, you know, in addition to the compensation plan where it shows the stipends that are authorized and the in the amounts that uh, the, on an, an annual basis, you know, that, that we consider that the, the district provide the board with information about as far as the actual allocation of the stipends, as far as, um, you know, the, the amounts and the number of individuals receiving stipends and, um, you know, similar to, to what we showed, just to provide the, that a little more detail for the board as far as the, the stipend allocation. Um, and then, we mentioned some of the um, differences or discrepancies between the payroll register and the compensation plan with respect to the stipend names. So we're recommending that the district consider uh, doing a, a review uh, to focus on the alignment of those just to make sure that the 
the uh, payroll register stipend information is is being called the same thing as the compensation plan um, and and just ensuring the alignment there going forward. With respect to the, the campus funds, um, we have a recommendation um, that, you know, we, we understand that the internal audit department does do periodic reviews of, uh, of different campus funds. Um, given the number of transactions, the number of campuses, um, and I believe there's currently two employees within the internal audit department, you know, it may make sense to add additional resources just to ensure that there's, you know, sufficient resources to review the, uh, the campus disbursements, um, you know, based on the size of the, of the district. And then we talked a little bit about the, some of the lack of visibility with respect to campus funds. And it's really driven by two things. One is, you know, if deposits are made for a fundraiser, it, it was frequently uh, the case that those would reflect, you know, the name of the individual of the campus who was making the deposit or responsible for the funds and difficult to tie the deposit to the fundraising event. And then on the disbursement side, there was uh, discrepancies, I'm sorry, not discrepancies, inconsistencies with, um, you know, the, the use of different vendors or merchants or, or payees that, um, you know, between campuses or even within the same campus. So, you know, for example, if the general fund, there's the uh, vendor master file, you know, where there's unique vendor numbers to ensure consistency. Whereas, you know, this was whatever gets input into the system by the person, you know, that day is what it is referred to as in, in school books. So it's, it just gets to be, you know, a little bit difficult to do analysis when there's, you know, the inconsistencies with the, the payee names on the campus funds. With respect to the, the travel expenses and reimbursements, um, we noted that there were some expenditures that were allocated to the object code 6411 for employee travel that appear to be related to on-site trainings. Um, and we just recommend that the district consider looking at that to see if there's uh, you know, if it still makes sense to uh, allocate those to that object code or a different one. Um, and we're not saying one way or the other, but that was, you know, just based on our observation that those seem to be a little bit different than the employee travel expenses description. Um, and then uh, with respect to the travel policy, which is uh, DEE regulation and the requirement for the purchase order to be received in the system at least two weeks in advance of when the travel is to occur. Um, you know, we just recommend the, cons uh, the district consider evaluating, you know, whether this time frame is reasonable. Uh, and, you know, if, if so, you know, how the district can improve the timeliness and getting those purchase orders approved within the, the two week period. For federal funds and grants, um, this relates to what we were just talking about with respect to the uh, the concerns that were raised during our interviews uh, with the special education department and, um, you know, the district considering commissioning an external review of the, uh, the special education department practices and procedures, um, and specifically, you know, by a, a firm that has subject matter expertise in special education, which is, um, you know, a little bit, it, it's, it's specialized and, and it, you know, that was something that we didn't feel comfortable, you know, doing um, ourselves. For purchasing and procurement practices, um, we we recommend that the, the district review those recent revisions from April 2022 related to CVA and CBB local, um, which assign the superintendent uh, or the superintendent's designee as chair of the administrative review committee. Um, and you know, we noted that standard industry practices uh, for the superintendent to review the recommendation that is formed coming out of the evaluation committee before taking it to the board, um, whereas the, the current policy and the process that we observed involved, you know, the superintendent uh, not only chairing the committee, but also being, you know, one of four evaluators, which, um, you know, could cause, um, you know, different concerns as far as, um, you know, other members of the committee, you know, um, you know, who 
have a different viewpoint or, you know, we're not saying that that's what happened, but, you know, just uh, as a standard practice, having the, the superintendent's role be more of reviewing the recommendation um, before it goes to the board. And then we recommend that the district review the purchasing policies uh, pertaining to construction contracts, uh, specifically the ones under $100,000 to ensure consistency between CH local, CV local, CVA local, and CVB local, um, which all have different provisions related to construction and, and just ensuring that there's, you know, um, consistency and um, it's it's clear across those those four policies. And then for purchases that are over $250,000 that are expended with federal funds, we recommend that the district uh, solicit quotes and bids through a formal competitive bidding process when possible uh, as a measure to ensure compliance with federal purchasing requirements. And then I'll also just add, you know, the ensuring best value um, for the district. For hiring practices, um, based on some of the, the concerns that were raised during the interview process and specifically perceptions of favoritism, uh, fear of retaliation, um, we're recommending that the district consider conducting a climate study across campuses and departments, uh, which would allow staff an opportunity to provide feedback anonymously, um, which would be uh, administered by an outside party. Uh, so the objective of a climate study would be to collect information from employees without fear of retaliation for purposes of improving campus climate. We also recommend that the district review DC regulation related to campus department interviews. Uh, there's just, I think, a clarification with one or two parents. This is kind of a specific one where I think two bullets got merged together, but we just wanted to, to mention that. Um, as far as DC regulation. Regarding records retention practices, um, we mentioned and, and based on our observations, you know, there's been significant process uh, since 2022 in improving uh, the records management, records retention practices, uh, including the use of outside firms to automate and digitize the record management processes. Uh, so we recommend that the district continue to monitor progress of the records retention practices and ensure alignment with best practices for a district of the size of Socorro ISD. Uh, given some of the concerns that have been raised uh, by the board over past practices concerning records management, we recommend administration provide updates at least annually to the board uh, concerning the active and inactive records being maintained by the district as well as uh, information related to the documents destroyed during the fiscal year. So this would, you know, just a, a high level overview of, you know, maybe the number of boxes that are, you know, part of the active maintained records and the inactive and what was destroyed during the, or was per the retention schedule, what was um, destroyed or disposed of during the, during the year. For board governance, we reviewed the team operating procedures, um, which provide a comprehensive guidance um, concerning duties, responsibilities, and requirements of board members and the superintendent. Um, we recommend that the board consider um, whether it makes sense to include an annual acknowledgement uh, for the board members to adhere to the guidelines included in the team operating procedures. I know that there's some school districts we've seen that have that where it's a either an annual or at the beginning of a of a new term, you know, a, a acknowledgement of, you know, these are the code of ethics and the policies and procedures and, uh, you know, an acknowledgement that uh, they're gonna comply with those. And then finally, uh, this relates to, you know, going back to adding resources to the uh, internal audit department or, uh, Alternatively, or in addition to that, potentially outsourcing the, the fraud, waste, and abuse hotline uh, to be administered by a third party. Um, and this would be, you know, for purposes of uh, efficiency or also just to, uh, you know, ensure the, you know, that people feel comfortable sharing information. Um, there's, I think it's more and more common to use an outsource, um, an outsourced, 
hotline for for larger uh, government entities, but just uh, something for consideration. And that was the end of the recommendations. I do have a slide. There, I know that there was a request regarding the the fees for the forensic audit. So on uh, in April of last year, we uh, presented the the work plan for phase two of the forensic audit. Uh, so this was what was presented in April of last year, um, which for phase two, the total was the 467,500. Um, and what we have invoiced, uh, I think we've invoiced through January and that amount is, uh, it's, I think it's around 447,000. Um, that's through January. We have, you know, the, our additional fees, we haven't submitted invoices yet for February and then through today. Um, I do anticipate that we will write off a portion of those, um, but, but, you know, we haven't prepared the invoice for anything past January 31st um, so far. Just a quick question, Mr. W uh, Mr. Kastner. Were you on track to present this to us in March, are you ahead of schedule or a little bit delayed? Um, I think we originally provided an estimate of nine to 12 months. Um, so I, I think that we're maybe a little bit behind schedule. This, uh, you know, I think we, we made the decision to prioritize the, the bond fund review uh, to have that you know, to the board in December so that there can, you know, any discussion that's impacted um, for a future bond proposition, the board would have that information. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're coming up on about a year or so, or maybe 11 months. I, I think we're within the range, but I think we probably would have, you know, originally aimed to be done within nine months. So by the end of calendar year 2023. So, um, yeah, I think it depends on how you look at it, but I, I think we would have preferred to finish several months ago. And my follow-up question is the third report, phase three, how soon did you have that information or finalized? When you say phase three, are you talking about the, the third report? Correct. Um, so we've, and we've submitted the draft of the report number two and report number three. So at this point, as far as the, the scope of work that's, that's shown here, um, I have a couple of to do's that one of which was, uh, trustee Barrera's comment about the, the campus funds that I'd like to update and make sure that that is, um, that number is accurate. And then. You know, the goal of today was to, you know, the, the board has received the draft reports, uh, wanted to provide the opportunity to discuss and answer questions. And so once we, you know, have gotten to the point of there's no outstanding questions from the from the board and we um, answer the open items that we have on our end, we would submit the final reports for uh, reports two and three to the board. And at that point, those are um, the board's reports you know they're, once they're submitted not in draft form um you know we're essentially turning those over to the board or to the district um with the board being the recipient also mr kastner all right thank you mr kastner Okay, well, thank you for your time, and thanks again for um, giving me the opportunity to, to present virtually, and uh, have a good evening. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> All right. Uh, continuing then with new business, discussing Discussion and possible action regarding fund balance presentation and recommendations. Ms. Bettis. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Correct. 
I do need to go back to the previous um, item. Um, I just want to make any anything further. If not, um, I'd like to move that um, Weaver and Tidwell gave us uh, a full list of recommendations. I move that we direct administration to create an action plan around those recommendations as appropriate and have such a plan ready um, to present to us, including uh, initiation of the policy reviews that um, Mr. Kastner recommended uh, to have those policies go to the appropriate committees um, as part of that action, but not wait until the action plan to start moving forward uh, to making those corrections as necessary. That's my motion. I'll second that, but can you amend and just add that we put this out to the public? Is Mr. Kastner gone? I, it's Once it's finalized, right, we can, correct? Yeah. Done. One request. Could we also, I know this is Weaver, but um, a lot of their recommendations coincide with TEA. Could we have administration make sure that we're addressing both of the um, discrepancies whenever they present us their um, corrective action? That makes sense. So that is incorporated as well. That's Second. my motion. Second. Seconded by Mr. Barrera. Any further discussion? May I ask a question? Do we have a timeline? I would like a timeline so that we can make sure we're on a, on a, we're doing this in a, an appropriate amount of time. Um, I, I am well, the motion was to time. see the action plan at the very next board meeting. Okay, thank you. But I would say that the duration then therefore is up to administration. There's things that we can change immediately. Okay. There's things that are gonna take, you know, a little longer to implement. So I would expect that that would be included in the action plan. Thank you. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Item passes. Thank you, Mr. You have a reminder. <coughs> All right. Now moving on. Um, Ms. Perez, uh, fund balance presentation, please. Yes, sir. Good evening again, Mr. President Najera, members of the board. My name is Vicki Perez, Chief Financial Officer. And tonight I will be presenting on, can we get the PowerPoint up? There we go. I'll be presenting on the fund balance to include recommendations for next year, including any implementations that we have done this year to reduce our expenditures, along with other pieces of information that is pertinent to what we are doing here. So I'm gonna go right into recommendations. So we'll be discussing the pay increases proposed, how we are reducing budgets, review of our master schedule, staffing, duplication of services, and the current year changes starting with proposed increases. Um, and I just wanted to be completely upfront about this. My proposal right now is a 0% increase, and that is based on what we have currently in our local budget, which is 433 million. And I know that number does not coincide with what Mr. Kasner presented. His was a 336, but this here is what is included in local, including subs, <coughs> salaries, TRS on behalf, um, stipends, retention bonuses, et cetera. So it is significantly higher than what was reported by Mr. Kasner. If we did a 1%, and this is just to show what that looks like if we did, because I did want to make sure that we at least discussed what it looks like, it would be 4.3 million just on the local side, just in general fund. And if we did 1%, which seems very minimal, this is what it would look like compounded over the years, whether it was a 1% or a 2%. And so I bring this up because 433 million right now is really tough to, to be able to move up from. And if we're doing this for the next couple of years, while it may seem nominal, but it will have a very big direct effect on the other amounts. The, the cuts that we have come up with have a total of about seven and a half million. And that was difficult enough. And so it, just the smallest amount compounded can be very detrimental to the overall budget. Can I provide just quick feedback? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Bettis, for transparency, if you're gonna recommend a 0% increase, we need the step scale. What does that actually look like? Even though we have a 0% increase, we do have employees that get a step scale, so what does that naturally look like? That way it, it supports the recommendation you're making. I do appreciate you bringing that one because that's been something that's on my mind, and I've 
I've reached out to TASB, TASBO, TEA, and we're trying to get a, di a direct answer as to whether or not the steps are a part of that, if there is a zero increase. We've, not everybody does a zero increase, so it's not something that is commonly known. This, I can honestly say this is probably the first time that I've recommended it. But I am gonna get further information. I don't wanna make that up. And so for transparency, I will include that as part of the, the information when we do the actual proposal. And that's part of the compounded piece. Because as an employee, they naturally get a step year after year. Mm -hmm. So even though you're proposing a zero, there is still an impact to the budget. That way it includes the, the compounded piece. So that part we do as a worst case scenario in case we do have, that is part of what we need to do. We are including that as part of the budget. Um, we, just we just discussed that today. So it's easier for us to include it as part of the budget as opposed to like tacking it on afterwards. So, so when we looked at reducing budgets, it was not easy. We talked about just general fund, just basic allotment. The, sta the state mandated funds that we have from TEA, those are absolutely mandated to spend X amount percentage. And so there are some that we have a harder time meeting, um, but there are some that we exceed. The ones that do exceed the mandates from TEA, we will look at those, um, but it was absolutely imperative that we discuss that we only do what least impacts students and least impacts culture. And I say that because I don't want what makes Socorro ISD to be special, I don't want that to go away. And I certainly don't want to have to affect the quality of education to our students. We also talked about how we can shuffle some of those funds around. In, it's important to remember that federal funds and state comp, those cannot be supplanted. And those are supplements to what we currently do. If it is part of a TEA mandate, we can't fund it out of that. If we have used a certain fund for funding a teacher, we can't just say, oh, now we're gonna move it over to here. So that the supplemental and supplanting is a very big part of what we were gonna do in the future. So when we looked at the, the areas, we talked about instructional, operational, RMP, retention and their energy savings. And I do wanna, I am very happy to say that of all of the changes, the least amount was 517,000 and that was 10% of the instructionals on functions 11 through 36. So at the campuses, between all 51 campuses, the, the 517,000 belongs to those campuses. I did not say cut this, cut that. I gave, we talked to the principals and we asked them, tell me what you want to be able to prioritize. I, I didn't want it to be something that hurts them and now they have to work through something. I want it to be something that was from their own personal initiative and they had a choice in what they were doing. Under operational, functions 41 through 99, we did ask for 15%. Um, again, the only difference was if it was going to impact the educational setting. And so RMP, we did not tell anybody you need to cut this person or that position. These RMPs are temporary employees. They are not full-time staff employees of Socorro ISD. They are part of a temporary agency that we contract with. So that's what the 6299 is. Now, this will primarily affect maintenance. And so because maintenance directly affects the learning environment, we did have a lot of leniency on that one because it's going to be making sure that the environment is conducive to learning. So we did talk with, with that department director and he had some ideas and I did, I did ask him to come back with what he feels that he can do on that end. So when we're talking about these cuts, it isn't, again, a, di a directive. It was more of what do you feel you can do on your end? And everybody is absolutely amazing. Every single one of the principals that I talked to was more than happy to do their part, and they were actually very appreciative that they had the say of what they can do in their own campuses. Part of the savings for next year will be that the retention stipend will not be included. That is a total of $6.4 million. 
And the energy savings, as of right now, we have 1.4 million saved from last year, and that was including two of the energy projects for two thirds of the year. The third one is finally done, so the last four months of this year will include all three initiatives, and I believe they will affect 36 campuses. So we anticipate that there will be a lot more savings as well as a rebate check that you will be seeing at our next board meeting. I believe that rebate from our um, El Paso Electric was going to be about $175,000. So that will be presented to the board. So we have currently an approximate reduction of 16.9 at this point. Now, I say at this point because these are things that we're still working through. We're still looking at what else we can do and how else we can navigate through what's coming up in the next year. And so at this time, I will invite Ms. Trejo to discuss master schedules. Okay. Questions? Good evening. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ms. Trejo. I think Ms. Macias has some sorry, questions just for a Ms. Question. Perez, please. Yes, so please teach me. On the retention stipend, I thought that was ESSER, so retention stipends hit 199? So the original retention stipend was 2.5 million in the prior year, and that was out of ESSER. Last year, we did inform the board that it was not something that we could sustain out of ESSER, and it was proposed to take it out of local. So for this past year, the $1,000 was out of local. Okay, and then energy savings, at what point are we gonna break even? Because I know it says three million savings, but what did we pay for it? Is this truly a savings, or are we still breaking even on what we, what we were charged for the services? So the return on investment on that, I can get back to you on that one. I have not looked into it, to be honest, but I can definitely get back to you on that one and calculate what that looks like. It was part of the, each individual's proposal, so I'll make sure that if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll get that out to you this week. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, Ms. Perez. Yes, ma'am. With regard to the operational instructional uh, cuts, um, when, when um, we were approached earlier today, they were talking about cuts and monitors and, and, okay, is there a way of, for the board to know what kind of cuts we're talking about? Only because I was surprised to hear that we're considering cutting monitors. Um, mm -hmm. Is, is there a list that? There is, we do have a list compiled. I have one internally. Um, I can tell you that monitors are part of our RMP. And so it's at the discretion of the campus to decide who is going to be part of that 50%. So if they are making a bigger cut in another area, then it's not gonna affect their 6299s. So we did not tell anybody, like, you need to do this person or that person, this position. It's at the, the discretion of the principal or the director. The other areas that have been discussed are travel, not to be confused with professional development. Um, me personally in my department, I have cut out travel, but professional development that happens online is more than fine because we don't pay for flight and hotel. Um, <clears throat> on HR side, I know that there was a, a PIA system that we were going to be implementing, and so we've moved that one over for an additional year, and we're, we're going to continue to do that one manually. Um, but it is something that we're going to look at for the following year. Under PR, we are cutting out the convocation, and that satisfies more than 15%. Um, so, and then attrition. Obviously, I know one of the departments has uh, reduced their staff by four this year. And it's a fairly small department, but that also covers what they can do within the local budget. But if, um, as we get closer to finalizing it, I'll be more than happy to share a list of what we're doing and which ones were reduced. I echo that, I think that's important. And, and with that, are there certain standards because as a principal, oh, I'm just not gonna have cross guards because that's, that's easy but yet is there a safety standard that they should adhere to to where they don't make that decision without truly meeting the needs of our, our students? So are we guiding them with that or we're just saying cut and it, it's your discretion on who you cut? Um, so I don't think that we have given a standard for safety, but I can definitely check with Mr. Livermore to make sure that whenever we are discussing that, that it's not 
um, compromising any safety that we're not going to have any additional safety issues. I'll definitely make sure of that one. Castellano, did you have a question, sir? Uh, just uh, you listed the retention stipend in here, but it's not part of a, a normal budget. It was something that was voted in by the board last year that came out of general fund, but previous was ESSER. Uh, I just think it's a little, uh, it doesn't reflect going forward that we, the 16 million, we're asking how we're reducing that $33 million. And well, the 6.4 is including the 30, the included in the 33 million. So well, that was from the past, but in the future, correct. So in the future, we won't have to sustain that. Yeah. So it is a reduction of 6.4 for next year's. Yes. Okay. Uh, I didn't sit right, but okay. Go ahead. Any other questions for Ms. Pettis? No? All right. Ms. Greco? Good evening, President Najera, members of the board. My name is Jennifer Trejo, and I am the Assistant Superintendent for Elementary Schools. And I am here to discuss the review of our master schedules. In a prior board meeting, the request was made to review our campus master schedules to ensure that we are maximizing classrooms at all levels. Campus principals, along with HR directors, staff classrooms throughout different times of the year based on their current and projected student enrollment to ensure enrollment matches the appropriate FTEs, such as teachers, office staff, custodians, et cetera. Considerations for future vacancies will include working alongside the Human Resources Department, including retirements, resignations, and attrition. This slide shows the current classroom waivers that have been submitted to TEA as noted on the slide. At this time, my team and I are available for any questions that you may have. So question, in reviewing the master schedule, what are you bringing forth? What are you recommending that there will be savings or cuts? Because that's what we're asking. So as far as the recommendation, um, right now, we don't know exactly how many resignations we have. I know we have them coming in as far as retirement, attrition, either they're moving or whatever the, the case may be for each of those individuals, but we don't have an exact amount. Some folks wait till the end to retire or separate from the district, so we don't know exactly how many um, folks will be leaving the district. As far as teaching is concerned, um, we do have currently the slide that you see in front of you. Uh, these classrooms are already maxed out at 1 to 23. So 176 classrooms already in elementary already have the maximum number of students. So w my reference to that is that we are doing everything possible to ensure that we are maximizing classroom instruction. Yeah, and that's always been um, a strength of Socorro um, yes, in the information that, that Mr. Castellano asked um, the Weaver report to, to review. If yes, you notice, we, we do do a great job in maxing the, maximizing the use of our FTEs. Correct. So I think what we were looking for, or what I was looking for, is are there any other staffing that we could be looking at? And you know, with the attrition piece, we have our ESSER funded individuals, anybody that received a letter saying you're not gonna be renewed. How, I think that's what we're, what are you gonna be doing? To, we care about our employees. We, we, need, we have vacancies. We know that we need to fill. So that's kind of what we're looking for. Absolutely. And those individuals that were funded through ESSER funds were notified that they could definitely apply for any of the positions that were available within the district. So that's all? All, all individuals that were ESSER funded or have some of them already be, been moved to some, positions? Some have already applied and received or been placed in other positions, yes, ma'am. So they've all applied? And I, the, to my understanding, yes, I, I would have to defer that question to HR. Will you remind us just for clarity, what is budget code 199? Uh, basic allotment, sir. President Nahara, Board of Trustees, just to add to that, we did talk about, um, we have double blocked math right now in most of our secondaries and we are Eliminating that except for students who need the extra support. It's not going to be a one for all anymore. We've made we've closed that COVID gap quite a bit. And then I did look at the um, retirements that have been submitted as of now. And there's 37 letters that have come in. 
we have 51 excess teachers, and I was able to match certifications. And this is, ran I mean, I'm, it's, they may not want this job, but I just wanted to match certifications. I could already place 30, which would leave us 21. And that doesn't include teachers that are still going to retire in attrition. So with those numbers and just from our experience, we are going to fill these vacancies, and we're going to have plenty of openings. So we're very confident that everybody's going to be placed, and at the end of the this year, we're gonna have openings just like we do every year. And I did not include SPED in this. We do have excess SPED teachers, but we know we're gonna place, we have a million places for SPED, we're good. So I hope that clarifies a little bit of what, how we're looking at it and making sure that we are not going to hire excess teachers. Based on this, we're not gonna hire any excess teachers. Okay. All right, so does that then, is that, um, part of the explanation on why there are no teacher openings posted right now because we're trying to okay. yes sir so when we were asked to do that it, they wanted us to take a little closer look and make sure that we weren't going to end up with 20 extra teachers from our experience those of us who've been in socorro for a long time we've never had extra teachers but we we did our due diligence and we're I, it's up to hr and of course dr carmen but we we do feel with lots of confidence that it would be okay to repost our positions I think what we're or what I'm asking as we move forward just adding a monetary amount to that and I know you're in the process because then that shows yes your work that you've done and the saving and including with human resources because right. those employees are kind of in limbo I'm going back to our ESSER employees because that's who I'm hearing from mm -hmm. is that they just got a letter stating you're going to become a substitute or you're going to be you know find and for your the most job part, we are able to uh, they can apply for positions we keep advising them to apply I do know we have a few that have not applied for positions yet some that have reached out for letters but there are openings for them uh, for most of them and, and at any point we're gonna help them they just need to come to us but they need to start applying and we keep trying to put that out there that don't wait don't wait for us to place you apply for the positions and some of them honestly have not are they able to apply even though the hiring is the positions well, we've are had those visible? That, that closed for about a week, so once we get it open again, yes, ma'am. Okay. Is it possible to have like a, a job fair or an internal uh, process for our ESSER applicants? That would be Dr. Applicants. <laughs> the priority staffing. Give them priority. Um, good evening, board members. Um, yes, I have shared that before, um, and uh, in my department, uh, we're already talking about how are we gonna support on this? We have ideas, we have plan, and um, we want to, one of the ideas is to post for a certain period of time, let's say 10 days minimum, uh, the positions for internal applicants only. So that way we tell our current uh, grant funded, because it's not just ESSER, we have other kind uh, of grants, hey, we're gonna give you this space so you can apply and you can have the priority for interviews and possibly be selected. So that's one of the strategies that we want. But I want you to know that we HR, we have normal cycles of staffing. Actually, we uh, planning to have mo one more staffing, right? Uh, that we always had during the years with all the principals when we review the numbers, right? If you have excess, if you will need teachers, and it's a combination. Uh, the departments, we cannot uh, work alone, right? We need to collaborate with the other departments, so we need a projection of number of students and how many students each campus potentially gonna have, how many teachers we're gonna need. So we need to be ready for that and with the the um, uh, vacancies that Melissa Parham is talking and the certification of the teacher try to also move those teachers on the campuses that they need. So um, our cycle of HR include all those that, that, that planning. So we, we're working on that. But I would like once the positions are, uh, someone give me the permission to, to open it. Uh, I planning to just post that for central period of time for our people. Okay. So they can have the opportunity to apply for our, yes. for our jobs. Okay, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So what I've heard is we value our employees. We know you got a letter, but we need you. We're gonna do a priority staffing. 
-hmm. and available vacancies you will have first dibs they're going to be posted internally and the reason that came up is just last week we were bringing in people from other districts to fill positions where our people said i didn't even have that opportunity again fair or not but now we value you we need you internal posting and will we, happen yes and we want to do that as soon as possible because we have planned two job fairs that we have been always very successful for that but we have it on hold because if we have closed our own positions how are we going to do a job fair right so we we still we're moving on that but definitely we want to value our current employees and and offer them the priority of uh, apply for the district so that's one idea that is coming. I'm also hearing as a cabinet, you're gonna to work together to make this happen. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Thank you. Do you wanna add something? Oh, okay. Thank you. Good evening, President Najera, uh, members of the board. Uh, Carlos Guerra, Assistant Superintendent of High Schools. Uh, following up on the request, uh, I, uh, I oversaw the master schedules for all our high schools, work with our principals. Also work, I, I work with our, uh, our departments to just make sure we ran st our, our staffing numbers and, and our course numbers for each one of them. Uh, overall, uh, after our spring staffing, um, when you looked at all, at all the movement between high schools and, and we have pluses and minuses, we're really only one over in our teachers total. We have one campus losing six teachers. We have one uh, gaining six teachers. So we're really one over. So we're pretty even. Uh, a couple of the openings we have uh, due to the retirements and stuff like that. We do have uh, three or four uh, SPED openings that are have never that have not been closed. They're currently open. Um, East Lake, uh, Pebble Hill, Socorro High School. So those are currently open. On the other ones, we have a couple of core uh, that are open. But in addition to that, uh, I look very carefully at uh, how balanced are our master schedules. I know the request last time was made in regards to some uh, coaches or, or possible positions that maybe are not carrying as large loads as other ones. Um, after careful review, uh, other than our, our head coach, athletic directors, our, our, um, uh, uh, our trainers, our student trainers, some of our student activities, uh, those are the ones that, and, and some of our department heads don't, that do not have full loads, very comparable to our, our competing district. Uh, according to the duties that they have on a daily basis. So my recommendation on the high school side is that, that right now we stay as is. I'm not recommending that we're cutting anything, just giving the volatile numbers that are going on. We're really at plus one and we actually open our, our transfers uh, April 1st. So we're gonna start seeing a lot of movement. I'm kind of excited because I know a lot of people still wanna come to score ISD. Any mm -hmm. questions for me? No, I'm good, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on, this one I don't have specific information, but I will tell you that when we are looking at when people leave, we are looking at possible attrition. I just want to make sure that it is noted that the attrition is not on the instructional side. This is district offices. If that <coughs> position is, and we will review it as a group with the cabinet, if that position is something that we can dissolve, then we will. And if it's absolutely necessary, then we will definitely keep it as well. So I, at this point, I don't have a number for that one, but that is something that we are looking at as we near the budgets. So again, in summary, at the, at the department or district level, at, through attrition, those are the positions that will possibly be sunset which was you know, a comment that was made earlier. So we are looking at district level. Oh, definitely. And if you look back at the amounts, the instructional side is the least amount affected. Operational, which is where the district level is, that is where the, that's the most amount that's happening overall. So the next area that we looked at was duplication of services. And we currently have a procedure for identifying the the duplicative, ser duplicative services on the instructional side. I do want to make a note before Dr. Starkey comes up because he does want to give a, a small, a very brief spiel on that. <laughs> and um, But I want y'all to know that on the operational side, we are looking at contracting a service and it is less than $10,000. And operationally, they will be able to evaluate 
any duplicate services that we have there. So I do think that that's gonna have a huge return on, on that investment there. And at this time, I will invite Dr. Starkey for his very brief discussion. <laughs> Thank you, Starkey. Thanks. Right. Good evening, uh, once again, President Nahara, members of the board. Um, this is, uh, what this is coming from is, um, is something that had come up in one of our previous meetings that we had about um, making sure that um, services aren't duplicated and one of and a process that we have in place that we um, decided that we wanted to include in this to share with you all well in the um, back in the summer of 2021 okay there was a neighboring district um, that an internal audit was released from that district and it showed all kinds of services being duplicated and all kinds of things being bought without any rhyme or reason. It was a long internal audit. Ms. Borrego got a hold of that once it became public and she summoned us, the academic services directors, to a meeting and we stayed in that room for a really long time and for two days or so and we hammered out a, um, district-wide needs assessment that we started having effective in the 2021-2022 school year. And the reason why was because what we wanted to make sure of was to be proactive and ensure that we were not duplicating services. That of course doesn't mean that there were never any controls or that no one ever looks at what's being purchased. I mean, that, those things have always been proven to exist through our audit, but we wanted, through our audit process, externally and internally, but we wanted to make sure that we had a deeper dive um, into it and really making sure that the um, programs are specific. It mattered then and it, matter, it matters now for sure because we wanna make sure that we are maximizing any source of, of revenue, whether it be general, whether it be federal, whether it be anything, okay? So we're gonna talk about um, instructional programs and materials and services. Okay. The overall overarching theme here is that what is requested to be purchased either at the campus or district level does not duplicate an already available program or service and that it gets properly vetted with stakeholder input and that it's reasonable and necessary. So in other words, if we were saying we wanted to get a, some kind of instructional supplemental program for dual language, it, we better have like the senior dual level, dual language teachers um, at the table, shouldn't we? You know, to, so they can vet the process, you know, and that's also goes for um, district level as well. And so we've designed it and we've continued to implement this and refine this for three years now. And what we say is, Okay, what is it and why? Okay, what is, the, what is the program? Why do you need it? You have to t tie it, not just tie it to the CIP, but show data, explain why, explain how this works, explain why it is good for students, um, show anything that supports it in terms of research, show evidence that it's been properly vetted. So let's say it's at the campus level and it's, something for early childhood. I mean, we don't wanna see that the fifth grade teachers saw, looked at it. We wanna see that the pre-K and kinder teachers looked at it. And then in the end, every year, and this is done through with academic services, uh, mostly Ms. Borrego, Ms. Accensory, and Mrs. Crosset, they actually request an evaluation of the program. Well, if it was supposed to bring star reading scores up, did it do it? Um, what, how much did kids use it? Was it used? And sometimes things are denied um, if we already have a service available, so we do not commit resources where we should not be. Another thing is that it can also be denied and not allowed to have for a second year if it was proof that like, well, you know what, this kind of didn't do the job or it would duplicate it, it would duplicate this. So we always are on, we are on guard with that. And another thing that I'm, I think that we also can, that we also have is that um, technology services followed the academic services model 
because they want to, and they use the needs assessment process because they want to prevent duplication in the form of stockpiling excess inventory and making sure that the approved bids that they have that are already set are looked at and ensure that available funding is maximized. So we take this very seriously. It's all online now. It's, um, it, it's, been, it's been very refined and we felt that it was important to um, discuss that we had a, we, we believe we have a solid internal procedure with that, especially with what faces us now. And um, last thing I wanna say is that it can be for federal funds, it can be for general funds. While we are not reduce, you cannot reduce federal funds because they're awards. But if you maximize out general funds, then you can look at federal funds, you can kind of balance it, see what's allowable. You can maximize more things by doing stuff like this. So we're, we were happy to be able to get the opportunity to share that with y'all. That that's uh, also something that we, take, that we take on to further the effort that we're all making as a team here. Thank you, Dr. Starkey. Oh, yeah, just feedback. Um, I commend the needs assessment process 100%. Since we're trying to find savings, my recommendation as you evaluate this, it, or as you evaluate all of the, um, I guess, things that are being recommended, could you provide, are there any items that you're recommending that we're taking off the table? And again, we're com I commend you for this, but we're here to try to see what savings we could potentially have as we work towards a balanced budget. So with this amazing process that you have, recommendation is to bring to the board, we evaluate it and these are certain things that we're recommending are duplicative or X, Y, Z for the 24, 25 They're, school year. They do, the programs do exist, um, things that we are going to pull and Perfect. I'm going to let Ms. Accenture expand on the specific instructional programs. Awesome, thank you. Good evening, President Nahara, members of the board. I'm happy to answer that question. We are looking at things that we can reduce next year, for example, with our new science teaks and science textbook that was just adopted. We will not be purchasing any supplemental materials uh, for science because we feel we need to give the textbook a, a full try to make sure that it meets our current needs. If it doesn't, then in future years, we may look at supplemental materials, but for this coming year, it is not, that has been taken off. So we are looking to reduce programs, and we do have a list where, which has been cut significantly. Um, many of those were funded out of ESSER, but we have um, reduced that to the bare essentials for next year. With, with those um, changes, were teachers involved in, in making those decisions? Are they already aware of the, the supplementals that will not be provided next year? Um, we have shared the purchases that we are moving forward with. Mm -hmm. What we based those uh, recommendations on, Ms. Gardea, was the current usage. Okay. So if we found reports and programs that were, that were not being utilized effectively at the campuses, we looked at those reports. So what we're taking away from teachers are the instructional resources and um, online programs that are not being heavily used. I just, to me, it's really important that we include the teachers at the table when we make these decisions because yes, they're the ones that can give us the most valuable um, information so that the cuts that we're making are not directly impacting our students. So thank you for including them at the table. Thank you, yes ma'am. And so lastly, I'm gonna go over some of the, the items that we have done in the current year. Um, when we talked about this, we talked about how it's going to affect next year's budget, but I thought it was important that we start implementing some of these changes as soon as possible. So we have three months left. We have April, May, and June before the end of the fiscal year. And there, uh, quite honestly, there's not a lot that we can do within the last three months, and even more so is that we cut off in April from all of our purchases. If we, so we do that because there has to be some lead time in receiving those items and clearing them out for payment before secretaries leave and the students leave for the, the school year. So um, they are well aware of those timelines and it's, this has never been a problem. There have been some areas where they're like, well, you know, I forgot to do this and we're very lenient and we just, as long as kids are not affected, we're, we're okay with it. So we have reduced travel. 
And again, I did tell you that we cut it all out out of the financial services, but at this time I am allowing online, unless it's a part of their um, campus improvement plan, or that's perfectly fine. Um, I'm monitoring stockpile. As Dr. Starkey said, we do monitor stockpiling. That is on the larger scale. I have asked purchasing to look at that, and the reason is because if they know that they're going to, they as in the campuses know that their budgets are going to get cut next year, I, it's law that whatever they purchase should be for the fiscal year in which it is purchased. And I don't want somebody to say like, oh, let's get two pallets of paper so that we can maintain this for next year. I mean, those things should not be affected as it is. So we are monitoring stockpiling. And internally, we are, whenever we're doing our bids, we're not just asking like, do you want to continue with this bid? We do ask, would, do you have a better price that you would like to submit? So those are things that we have discussed. And quite honestly, whenever we go out for quotes, we will ask them, hey, is this the lowest you can go? Because quite, they're not, that's all, not always the lowest they can go. And we have gotten some better pricing in that process. And we are looking at future purchases to phase in. And by that, whenever I'm talking to the operational side, mostly the operational side, when it comes to uniforms or um, basic equipment that is needed, uh, vehicles, as opposed, I want them to have a five-year plan on how we're going to phase in that, that material or those uniforms as opposed to one whole bulk purchase. So if there is a, a plan for 10 uniforms one year, 10 the next year, and we're going to do that all with intention, then I think that that's a much better approach as opposed to just like, oh, it's time to get it now. I need a million dollars. So we're making sure that that is very intentional with the, with the departments that it pertains to. So at this point, I do want to open it up to see if there is any additional information that y'all are needing as we move forward. I know that we will be getting um, the few requests that have been mentioned. That way we can supplement our next piece of inform our next piece of the meeting with that. But is there anything else that you feel like we need to include as part of these presentations and discussions? Because we will be moving towards budget discussions very soon. Yes, with the budget discussions, of course, the projected revenue, if you could give us yes. an idea of that, where those funding sources are coming. Mm -hmm. My understanding is we're getting less from the state, so what does that look like for Socorro ISD? That way we know, you know, apples to apples. And then just the proposed expenses for the 199, I know that you all mentioned, you know, campus operating, campus personnel, um, department operating. Uh, department personnel just just the way we saw the last time I think it was from our facilities department where they put the, everything on one page mm -hmm. I think that gives us a better understanding and then I agree with um, what Ms. Gardea said just the transparency yep. if there's anything proposed for a possible adjustment we want to see what that looks like not us but that way all of our um, staff does and the more that you could involve um, individuals I think I heard that you talked to principals uh, possibly departments so the more that you could include that and then including who you talk to, that way individuals could say, no, that is correct, or no, I was never. Right. That way it's just that transparency that you're building that trust uh, within our stakeholders. There's amazing stakeholders within SISD that could help with this. We know it's not a one year, you know, one and done. It's year two, year three, same thing for um, healthcare services. You all have heard that many are not in line with the direction we were going. So what are other options? Are we looking at Region 19? Are we looking at a three-year plan to use our current um, plan that we have and make adjustments to that to ensure that it is in the best need of our district? This is the time to start creating all those Correct. plans to share with the board. So that's my recommendation. Yes, ma'am. When you go back to the payroll budget and after listening to everything, the numbers that you're giving, is that just with the numbers as far as FTEs, that's the way our students is? So you're pretty much giving us as, are those numbers pretty much the plateau numbers, so to speak? As far as the payroll budget? Yes, because everything, all that's going to affect the payroll because obviously the attendance and all that. So Correct. that's all going to affect it. So is this, the numbers you showed, is that showing growth or is that showing just the FTEs are going to stay 
occurring from 25 all the way to 28? That is if we included a 1% or a 2%. And at this point, I'm not, um, I'm not, first of all, I'm not making a recommendation right now. But when I do make a recommendation, it's going to be for a 0%. So the growth, obviously, because you're not mentioning growth here. You're just saying when I'm, so what I'm hearing is for 20, let's say we have 7,000 employees. Mm -hmm. So for 25, 26, 27, and year 28, we're going to have those 7,000 employees for all those four years. That's what the numbers would look like, correct? That is if there was maintained. And if there is um, a drop in enrollment or an ADA, that's where the staffing is going to be taking place to make sure that the classrooms are adequately staffed and the teachers are, each period is optimized. Okay, that's what I just want to make sure that I establish. You know, for the next four mm -hmm. years, if, the, if our employees, if we have 7,000 employees, that's what the number looks like for 7,000 employees. Correct. Yes, sir. I guess what I'm looking for too is hearing from previous numbers, it shows that there's potential still for growth, but it also looks like we're plateauing. But then come 2030, it looks like we may start declining. So I want to see those numbers in those three different phases. If we're with growth, if we're at a plateau stage, or if we <coughs> actually start decreasing. Okay. Because, I, I mean, it, just like Ms. Macias said, it's, you know, this isn't just one year. It's going to be for the next several years to come through. So we need yeah. to anticipate, the, you know, the trajectory of those three. Okay, certainly. And I do want to make sure that it's noted that this is considering TEA has not given an increase on salaries since 2019. Now, if from now until TEA goes into the next legislative session, which we would be in 2025, if there are any mandates or any special sessions that give out a mandate, those will most definitely be taken care of. That will not be ignored at all. So regardless of what recommendations are, those are primary um, priorities. I'm glad you mentioned that because TEA has not provided districts any type of relief no. for many years, even though there's billions. Nor have they provided for cost of inflation ever. That has always been one of the concerns. And um, I, when we talk about lobbying, that's always the, the thing that I discuss. We have not been including inflation. We have not been including cost of living. And we are not being funded by... ADA instead of enrollment. I mean, we're not being funded by enrollment instead of ADA. We still have to prepare for the amount of students that we have. Whether or not we have them in class, it's, sometimes it's beyond us. So I do think that that's one of the important things that the TEA takes into consideration. And unfortunately, there are too many districts in our predicament. Correct. We are There's, not alone in this. this but we will find big, a solution together. Absolutely. This is a very big statewide concern. Also, also, Mrs. Perez, if uh, Ms. Maribel hit the spot when she said our biggest budget is obviously our, our payroll. Correct. Second one is our health. Uh, a month ago, we had TRS come down here and give us a presentation. And I'm not for TRS, but maybe we reach out to Region 18, Interlocal Agreement, talk to them out there. Mr. Camona gave us a plan, a five-year plan several years ago about raising our copay. We should look into that again, raising our copay. Our clinic, it's a great job. We don't make no money off the clinic. That's a deficit also the clinic. We have to look at that. Maybe from $10, we raise it, baby steps. But maybe come back with a plan of five years of our, of, of our insurance. Uh, look at our third party insurance also as well. Yes, so uh, we can uh, reach uh, Region 19. And I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, we can reach Region 19 for alternative options. If, if you want a HR department, do that. and and uh, and present for you uh, opportunities uh, uh, or different plans, right? But directly with Region 19, if that's what. Yes. And I liked what Mr. Guetta said is, you know, what is that cost of that third party administrator that, that occurred? That way we're truly maximizing and sure. keeping our business local. Yes, well, it's in our area in Mario Carmona's apartment and we can uh, start uh, reaching out Region 19 for alternative options of different plans, maybe to keep the, the insurance that we have, but with uh, a more extended plan to show savings numbers. Mm -hmm. okay. Anything else? No. So the last slide is, talks about the next meeting, but I'm going to give you all some time to think about 
when that's back. going to be, yes. And so if you want to let me know or let Claudia know, and I'd be more than happy to, to make that work. Ms. Perez, and I just, I want to take the opportunity to say thank you, because I'm sure that many of you could hear the level of frustration in my voice last time we met. Um, I didn't notice her. <laughs> <laughs> That's why this one was so short. I was in very intentional in keeping it as short as possible. But this is a step in the right direction. This is what we need. You know, we have um, great leaders sitting right here before us. Each one of you represent a very separate and distinct area, and by coming together as a team, each one, um, you know, um, bears a little of the burden with the one thing in mind, you know, reducing student impact. Mm -hmm. We can get creative and come to solutions, um, you know, that, that still keep us as a great district, that still allow us to take care of our employees, et cetera. Yes, cuts hurt. They do. All the time, you know, anytime. Unfortunately, we're not getting any help from the state, even yeah. though we had a massive surplus fund you know, the legislatures didn't support us. Our governor doesn't support us. We were hoping that it would be different, but hope isn't a strategy. So we have to come here, you all, as you've done, and, and, and make sure, you know, that we're taking the actions necessary because it doesn't seem, you know, that additional funding from the state yep. is going to come for us. So just thank and you, and then we'll If discuss. I can piggyback off on that, sir, the, the cabinet has been absolutely wonderful. But I think the, the stars of this are the principals and the directors. They have been absolutely amazing and willing to be a part of a solution. And so I do want to recognize them as well. Thank you. So um, do you want to discuss another meeting right now, or do we want Ms. Bettis to go back and just consider what the next steps are in proposed dates? OK. Which one? We could look at our calendars whenever we're at executive and then we will definitely let you know it'll be sooner than Rather later than later yes mm -hmm. okay. this is important to us that sounds perfect actually that if y'all can get me a couple of dates then we can work on um, an appropriate amount of time for getting this all right uh, I'm sorry if I may just yes, you said that which normally we start it in February and March we need to start working on budget yes and so some of these plans we need to know their impact on our next year's budget. So yes. when do you have a plan of starting budget talks? So my intent was to discuss that in March. March was a very fun month. So <laughs> so we'll, we, as soon as y'all are ready, we can, we can discuss that as well. I was actually working on revenues, the summary of finance revenues today. And so we can start looking at what that looks like. And um, Susan has been wonderful with working on the next year's budget too. So she had that ready. She's implementing some of these um, minor changes and... So we can combine the two? We budget can. Budget and fund balance? Absolutely. That's a great idea. Sounds good. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Pettis. All right, continue with new business discussion, possible action regarding audit services for additional scope of work related to audit report from Weaver and Tidwell and process for the selection of audit firm to include possible um, RFQ or RFPs. So, um, I'm sorry? Um, board President Nahada, members of the board, uh, Mr. Barrera asked a question earlier about what we do with a pending, I guess, request for qualifications that the district has out that's not been responded to. Um, you can include directives to administration. I forgot that we had this agenda item on the agenda tonight, so it'll allow you to address that scope if you want to, if you want to go out for additional areas right. to be reviewed by an RFQ and RFP process. I think you selected Weaver through an RFQ. We did. So just as a reminder, we still have that R outstanding RFQ for the special, educa uh, special education review, et cetera. That is still outstanding. But this particular item, um, and so then, Mr. Blanco, I'll get back to the questions on that. This particular item also includes, I think, you know, there's some uh, areas Weaver and Tidwell have completed their scope. Yes, they have a couple of follow-up items for us. Yes, they need to, you know, finalize the report because as they've said, you know, Mr. Kasner said it's in draft. The final will come, you know, pretty soon. But there are some areas in there that I think they, um, 
it was it was you know the scope was limited because it was the initial there may be other areas that we want to explore further and that might come from uh, an RFQ or an RFP where we share what these initial reports are and then the respondents whether it be Weaver and Tidwell or anybody else know what we've already looked at and they can then provide a proposal for us to continue um, these efforts so that right there but then um, Mr. Blanco, so we know that we haven't gotten any response, responses. Is it, you know, can we call other districts and then initiate contacts with any firms they recommend so that we can ask them to respond to our special education? You can have the purchasing department do outreach to see if there are available firms in the area. It may just be that there aren't. I don't know the answer to the question. Um, you can certainly ask and see if there are firms who have performed similar services at other um, school districts, either here in El Paso or reasonably close by where they might be willing to come to El Paso to do the work. Um, I don't know what the scope of work was defined in the audit request that's outstanding for an RFQ as to why you didn't get any responses. That is a little unusual. Um, do you know what it is? And this is the response to the special education one. That's the RFQ Just that we've not. It was specific to special education I, that we didn't get any responses to, or we haven't yet. I do believe that Mr. Blanco is correct on that. A lot of the people that submit their bids, they want to know what the scope of work is. If we need to, um, we can probably do an addendum to that and at the board's discretion outline what it is that you would like to have um, in, looked into that way they have they as in the community has a better understanding of what the job is I I Sorry, go ahead. I thought it was clear that we were and mr. not stated like we were looking specifically for special education So was Correct. it not when it was put out there was it not? Did you guys not word it specific to special education by sp specific it would need to say look at IEP records number two evaluate services at XYZ campuses. It has to be very specific. Quite honestly, that is just one of the things that um, that does impede some of that process. As a matter of fact, on a similar but different note, the, the RFP for the climate survey, that was another one where they asked for just a little bit more of a scope. And because we didn't have a scope, we didn't get as many respondents. So we can probably look at what another district has done and see what their scope was so that we can have a starting point if you'd like. That was gonna be my recommendation. It's just okay. program evaluation of special education services. And I know if you work with the department, special education has specific things that they do and you know IEPs, ARD, I mean, and I won't right. go on. And that is the scope. We are looking for a program evaluation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can we get that together? Yes. Absolutely. All right, sounds good. What about then um, expanding upon or continuing uh, the audit work, um, getting an RFP, a proposal from a firm who would continue those services? Is that, do we want an RFP for that? Yes. Okay, so I think we need a motion to um, issue, publish an RFP continue or to build upon the services that have been provided <coughs> by Weaver and Tidwell. So moved. Second. A motion made by Mr. Barrera, seconded by Ms. Macias. Any further discussion? I have a, I have a question. W what uh, items specifically are you going to ask the administration to include in that scope of work? What items specifically? The procurement process. Right. And the allegations uh, made by Weaver on the third report, which okay. was possibly contract steering. So you want some other audit firm to come in and do follow-up work forensically on um, what Weaver's designated as the third report, which really is subpart of report number two, but it's the third report. Um, well, you said East. we had to do an, an RFQ. We, we still have to put it back out again. Be, whether Weaver did it or not, and put it out because their work is complete. That's so. fine. I just the uh, administration is going to need to know what 
they're soliciting for, people are going to ask. I don't know it, that you could just say a follow-up report from Tidwell. Okay. And there was Tidwell. some information identified by board members that need to be looked okay. yeah. Review Ms. contracts, has. yeah. Review contracts that were procured in the tenure and uh, were all procurement process followed accordingly. Anything else? Um, policies, the policies. Procurement policies? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Specifically policies that were placed on regulation or, yeah. That was in one of the recommendations from the Weaver Report. But, it's, but especially there. specific to when Carmen came in. Or if, he, if was, Weaver feels that he needs to go further, then he can go further. That, that, yeah, that timing issue you can discuss with the audit firm when they're selected. Anything else? Um, I, I think the, the audit firm that comes in now uh, should be available or have a, a some sort of a, uh, number or a web page available where people from the district can actually reach out and say, I I've observed this uh, and I can't report it to the district because of retaliation. And that came up in the Weaver report, fear of retaliation. And I think the, uh, that, that firm that comes in should have some sort of access or open either it's to the public or, or employees uh, so they can report in and they can give that information. This is what's going yeah. on and this is what we're getting out here in the district. I, I understand the desire for that, but I can tell you um, experience wise, because that would involve investigating an existing or future. If you're looking at past events, they're audited. So an audit firm can go back and look at records and documents that, that if somebody were to call a hotline, I think is what you're referring to, yeah. say, I believe I saw this, but I'm afraid to report it because that'd be a forward-looking investigation. That would be open-ended, almost never-ending. Um, you can ask, I think, when you get responses to the firms and say if there's some portion of that type of work that they can do, looking backwards, perhaps they'll say yes. But but yeah, we can ask and yeah. to see if it's out there. I just don't know that you'll get a firm that will respond and affirmatively say we will accept once we're engaged hotline calls and then investigate them all well it, it could just, we can ask yeah okay and a motion. okay so that was the motion right and it was made by mr barrera seconded by Ms. macias any further discussion all those in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed aye. item passes all right <coughs> continuing then to executive session the meeting is to be closed for discussion in legal counsel Oh, for discussion with legal counsel regarding the employment and transition of Superintendent Dr. Ann Carmen to include duties, contract of employment, and to discuss potential candidates for appointment as interim or acting superintendent, and to consider the recommendation of the administration to reassign Ms. Yvonne Romero from the Coordinator of Culture Opportunity to that of AP at Americas High School under Texas Government Code Sections 551.071 and 551.074. Time is 9.38. The date is March 25th, 2024.
Back in session, the time is 10.52. The date is Monday, March 25th, 2024. And we have a confirmed quorum. Moving on with uh, board new business. 8A, discussion of possible action regarding employment duties and contract of Superintendent Dr. Ann Carmen. Mr. President, uh, based on discussion held in executive, I make a motion that we place Dr. Nate Carmen on administrative leave with pay. Second. I have a motion made by Mr. Castellano, seconded by Mr. Barrera. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I abstain. Item 8B, discussion and possible action regarding recommendation of administration to reassign Ms. Ivan Romero from the Coordinator of Cultural Opportunity to that of Assistant Principal at America's High School. Mr. Najera, um, administration recommends that we pull this item. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Borrego. All right, there be no further business before this board. Uh, we are adjourned at 1053 on Monday, March 25th, 2024.